Good morning uh, and welcome to our fourth meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. Um, I would ask everyone at this point, as I normally do, to switch off uh, mobile phones, um, as they often can interfere with the sound system. Um, I, I would ask um, uh, you know, panel members and, and indeed people in the uh, public gallery to, to, to note that uh, you, will, you will see clerks and indeed members of the committee using tablet devices, which, is, uh, which we're using to... Um, instead of our hard uh, copies of the papers. Uh, can I welcome also Pat uh, Patrick Harvey, MSP, who joins us for agenda item number three. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, on agenda item number one, um, I invite the committee to agree, please, to take item five in private. Item five is a consideration of a, uh, uh, an approach uh, paper to the Commonwealth Games legacy. And we normally take uh, these papers in private. Can I have the committee's agreement to do so? Thank you very much. Um, we now move to agenda item number two, uh, which um, is the uh, appointment of a European Union reporter. Um, I have had a, an indication that Richard Lyle uh, is, uh, is happy to take on this role. Has the committee uh, agreed that Richard uh, Lyle shall be uh, the committee's EU reporter? Thank you very much for that. Um, we now move to agenda item number three um, uh, and continue our scrutiny of the Assisted Suicide Scotland Bill. Uh, we have uh, two roundtables uh, uh, <coughs> sessions uh, this morning. Um, and can I welcome uh, all our roundtable members uh, to the committee? As usual, um, with a roundtable, I will, uh, I will invite everyone to introduce them themselves. Uh, first of all, I should, uh, and I'll introduce uh, Dr. Mary Neal, uh, who is uh, the committee's uh, 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 advisor. And, and my name is Duncan McNeill, MSP for Greenock and Inverclyde and convener of the committee. Bob. Good morning. Um, uh, I'm Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow, and I'm deputy convener of the committee. Hi, I'm Jennifer Buchan. I'm from the Humanist Society Scotland, and I'm actually one of Duncan's constituents. Thanks. Good morning, I'm Richard Lyle, uh, MSP Central Region. Um, good morning, I'm Gordon MacDonald from Care for Scotland. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP Mid Scotland and Fife. Dr Peter Saunders from the Care Not Killing Alliance of Organisations. Good morning, Colin Keir, uh, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. Mike McKenzie, MSP Highlands and Islands Region. I'm Dr Bob Scott, my life, my death, my choice. And good morning. I'm Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Sheila Duffy. I'm a retired journalist and a member of Friends at the End. Nanette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Patrick Harvey, member in charge of the bill. Thank you. Welcome uh, yeah, again to you all. And I'll move directly to our first questions from Dr Richard Simpson. Yeah, this is probably one of the most contentious bills that we've had in front of the Parliament, and this is, I think, the third time, uh, Patrick, we've had a, a bill of this sort. Um, yes, anyway, you know, it is something which has been discussed on a number of occasions. But the fundamental, uh, so to, the fundamental dichotomy that we're faced with is um, a desire which the public are expressing quite strongly in terms of autonomy um, in relation to this bill on the one hand, and on the other hand, protection of vulnerable individuals. And you know, although the public may be strongly in favour, it's obviously Parliament's uh, strong duty to ensure that those who are vulnerable are, are not going to be uh, subjected to undue pressure as a result of this bill. So my opening question to the, to the panel is, you know, how do they see us in this bill ensuring uh, the, the potential for uh, autonomy? Is that in what it's about? Is that all that it's about? And on the one hand, and on the other hand, do, do you feel that it, it does protect uh, those who are vulnerable adequately? Um, I think um, the, the first point I would make is that um, public opinion polls um, are, are often quite fluid on this issue, when, particularly when you present counter arguments. And CARE conducted a UK wide opinion poll last year, specifically related to the Faulkner Bill. 
in which we presented five um, of the counter-arguments and the level of support fell from, I think it was 73% to 43%, and it was equal with, with those who opposed the bill. So, so the, the point really is, is that in terms of judging public opinion, it's quite difficult to judge public opinion on the basis of a simple question. You have to give people the, the full arguments and then let them think about it and, and make up their mind on that basis. Um, well, I, I take the point that Gordon's making that uh, in all surveys conducted recently, the vast majority and generally around two-thirds of uh, public opinion is in favour of a change in the law as long as there are safeguards and lo as long as the person has made that decision themselves. You know, I, and it's not just... Um, Gordon and I have had this argument before. Ordinary people, once they think it through, you know, and it's not... As, of course it's not a simple thing. This is a very contentious bill. That's why it makes it so important that we have to uh, consider it very seriously. And, um, you know, I talk to a lot of ordinary people. I come from a very ordinary background. I talk to taxi drivers and people on checkout and things like that. It's not just those and such as those. It's not just... Terry Pratchett and Jeremy Paxman and Richard and Judy. It's ordinary people, when you actually talk to them, say, yes, I saw my mother, my brother, my gran suffering in this way. I think there should be a change in the law. And uh, disabled people and religious groups as well, when they're asked, um, as I say, around about two-thirds want a change in the law. And I think it's, you know, our MSP's responsibility to, to bring that about. 20 years going right back to the uh, House of Lords consultation in 1992 and the figures that have been quoted in favour of a change in the law on this issue have always been around the 75 to 80 percent level and I think the point that, that that Gordon is making is that this is largely uninformed public opinion the the care poll was striking because support for Falconer's bill which was not dissimilar to Patrick Harvey's dropped from 73% to 43% when the five major arguments against it were heard. And those arguments were, first of all, that every disability rights group in Britain is opposed, Disability Rights UK, the UK DPC, SCOPE, um, not dead yet, that every medical group was, op was opposed, virtually the British Medical Association, most of the Royal Colleges, the one or two that were neutral, that when you change the law, you put pressure upon vulnerable people to end their lives for fear of being a burden, either a care burden, financial or emotional burden. And then uh, also that the experience of other jurisdictions shows both an incremental increase in numbers and a widening of the scope of categories of people to be included. So it's uncommitted opinion. I think it's also uh, un at least it's uninformed opinion. It's also uncommitted opinion in the sense that people will often give a reflex response to what are often very high media profile, celebrity driven often, hard cases on the media, and it's natural that they respond in the way that they do, but actually it's not a voting issue for most people. And I think it's also unconvincing in the sense that, for example, uh, most people support the return of the death penalty, but we, we don't uh, reintroduce it because of the risk of innocent people being damaged. That's this collateral damage issue. And that's why really complex and difficult issues like this are not decided by uh, opinion polls or referenda, but that they must be decided by elected representatives who've had the opportunity to weigh all the evidence very carefully. Dr. Gott. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, there's a number of points uh, that Dr Saunders raised there that I might come back to later, but to refer to Dr Simpson's original question, there is indeed a balance to be struck between autonomy of the individual and protection of society at large, protection of the vulnerable. And we're in the fortunate position of being able to look to evidence from elsewhere. There is no evidence, for example, in Oregon, that uh, theoretically vulnerable groups in society, the very old, the less well-off, the, dis the disabled, are more likely to resort to assisted dying than would be suggested by their uh, proportion in society. So we believe that uh, there is huge public support for this, that not only do voters support it, and clearly the poll showed 69% of them do, with 78% declaring that it's important or very important that this bill is passed. 
The concepts underlying the bill, though, which I think Dr Simpson referred to in our view, are three. There is freedom of choice, autonomy for the individual, but there's also compassion and tolerance. We believe there's substantial moral equivalence in this debate. It's quite proper to arrive at a different conclusion based on the same evidence, according to one's beliefs. But we don't support the bill because a majority of the population are in agreement with its aims, although they do, but because we believe it's the right thing to do. Could I just say on yes. the um, disabled point, um, certainly the spokesmen for lots of different disabled groups are very vociferous and, and very critical uh, of any change in the law, but the actual facts, if you actually look at the facts, Lord Law of Dalston, who is himself disabled, speaking certainly in support of Lord Faulkner's bill, referred to a YouGov opinion poll which was conducted amongst registered disabled people and 79% of them, <coughs> excuse me, 79% of those registered disabled people supported a change in the law to allow the terminally ill who were competent adults to control the time and manner of their death if they consider their suffering uh, unbearable. And it's not just Lord Dawson and um, Baroness Brinton, who uh, again is in a wheelchair, supported um, Faulkner's Mill in the House of Lords. Um, she is a Christian. She believes her loving, benign God that she worships would not allow her intolerable suffering. I think it's very easy to say, well, all doctors are against this, all disabled groups are against it. The actual facts, when you look at when disabled people are asked and polled, is quite different. I note your interest, Dennis. I'm going to you know, encourage some discussion. And, and uh, Dr. McDonnell, um, on the on the issue of Oregon, um, the last time this bill was or this issue was considered by the Parliament, the End of Life Assistance Bill Committee, which considered it, took evidence from Linda Ganzini from Oregon, and uh, Linda Ganzini um, conducted a study which showed that 26% of people who were getting access to commit suicide in Oregon were depressed. Um, so I think, you know, there are concerns about Oregon, not just in relation to people who are depressed, but also the lack of safeguards, the lack of reporting mechanisms. There are quite a lot of concerns about the, the way the system operates in Oregon. But nevertheless, this bill, which is before us today, is not like the Oregon bill. In some ways, it sits between Oregon and, and the Swiss experience. Um, so the, 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 the situation in Oregon can't be read across automatically into the Scottish context. Richard, do you want to come back? Yes. Uh, one of the concerns I have about this particular bill is the breadth of, and scope of those who are eligible, that it's a life-limiting condition. And, I, you know, <laughs> all our lives are limited in some way, but, uh, you know, if, if we look at life-limiting, that is a pretty broad definition. It's not, as the Faulkner Bill says, equally difficult to define, but terminal illness within six months. Uh, so we're dealing with anyone who feels their life is limited in some way or who a doctor says their life is limited. So the example I gave, which is an extreme example, is if you've got type 2 diabetes, you can expect to live 20 years less than the average life expectancy. Therefore, it's life-limiting as a condition. Um, so, I, you know... The, so my next question is, if we proceed with this bill, what measures should be taken to improve, uh, the, uh, improve the situation so that it is focused on those for whom this may be a, an appropriate measure? Dr Scott. Thank you. I would agree, uh, Dr Simpson. I think there is room for improvement in the, in the wording uh, around this. That in the policy memorandum and accompanying notes to the bill, makes the intention of the legislation clear. But the wording leaves me and many others, I think, in some doubt as to specifically to whom it's referring. Um, clearly, the intention was not to say everybody with diabetes was eligible to immediately proceed. But yes, there is room for improvement in the wording there, and we would be happy to contribute to that. Anyone else? Dr Saunders and, and Dr McDonald. Yes, we're, we're deeply concerned about the very wide scope of this bill because we're, we're not just talking about people um, with terminal illnesses, but, but 
the fact is that most progressive conditions will have a life-shortening effect. So not just cancer, coronary heart disease, chronic obstructive airways disease, uh, neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, uh, dementia, and, and many mental illnesses, and many also acquired and congenital disabilities will all fall within the remit of this bill. And, and what we need to grasp is that at the end of the day, it's not whether the person qualifies under the auspices, but if the person feels they qualify, or if a doctor is willing to put a signature to a paper to say that they qualify. And if we look at the Oregon experience, in Oregon there is a six-month life expectancy. But in fact, uh, people have lived uh, for several years after being uh, given authority under the Oregon to, to uh, build to kill themselves. And, and in 2013, according to the statistics, 16.9% of those killing themselves did not have these terminal illnesses. If you read the footnotes of the annual report, they included deaths due to benign and uncertain neoplasms, other respiratory diseases, diseases of the nervous system, Parkinson's, musculoskeletal and connective tissue diseases, viral hepatitis, diabetes, cerebrovascular disease, alcoholic liver disease. So, so even in Oregon, what, you, what happens when you change the law is that people go up to the new law, they go beyond the law, doctors will be prepared to, to sign it, and even in Oregon we're seeing that the scope goes far beyond what, what is there. So with the, the scope, the incredibly broad scope that we have uh, in the Harvey Bill, which includes even the ageing process, or arguably even life itself as a life-terminating condition, uh, I, I think you're encourages, encouraging a free, uh, free for all, and when you combine that with the uh, woeful lack of accountability and, and the savings clause, clause 24, w which seems to give the benefit of the doubt to anyone who's involved, even for acts that are, uh, you know, are careless or uh, omissions and so on, I think you've got a, a, a recipe for uh, really quite concerning <coughs> incremental extension and mission creep here. Dr. McDonald, then I'll, I'll let you in. Certainly, if I'll, I could just say... I'll on let you in after Dr. McDonald. Oh, I, I, yeah, I'll call them back. Um, I, mean, I think there, there is an issue of principle which um, Richard Simpson has touched on in his first question, which you know, the committee needs to consider. Is As a society, do we want to move towards um, sending a message out that some people's lives are not worth living because of the quality of life that they perceive themselves to have? Or do we say, well, no, we have a responsibility to protect those who are in a vulnerable position, who might feel a burden on family, on friends, on the NHS, um, who might, for, for, for whatever or other reason, um, feel under pressure um, to commit suicide. So the, that's the fundamental issue of principle about the autonomy of the few versus protecting the, the, the needs and the interests of the many. Um, but I think in terms of um, this particular bill, um, it's not just today, but in previous weeks you've heard evidence about concerns about about the, the wording in this bill. The Justice Committee has come up with many concerns about the drafting of this bill. Uh, and my feeling is, is that um, this bill needs to be put in the bin. Uh, and even those people who would want to see this legislation or similar legislation come through should go away and draft another bill because this bill is so full of holes um, that it needs to be dismissed at stage one. Uh, of, of Oregon and the inference that uh, Peter Saunders made about, you know, this, uh, well, inferring a, a slippery slope. Once you do, um, uh, you know, allow a certain category of people to have an assisted suicide, then it broadens, then it becomes wider, then the slippery slope. Well, there's no evidence, of course, of that in Oregon. It's been in uh, a law for 17 years. It hasn't been amended. It hasn't been broadened. It hasn't been uh, changed in any way. Can I just go back, though, to this, the arguments, which I know are sincerely held by Gordon and Peter, that the status quo is much better than a leap into the unknown. Well, actually, the status quo is not working. The law is not working now, and it doesn't need me to tell you that, or Baroness Warnock in the, the House of uh, Lords. The law does not work at the moment. It doesn't protect anybody. It's a fudge. And if you look at uh, Keir Starmer, had to... 
make ver various pronouncements to try and clarify the Debbie Purdy case and things like that. Nobody accepts that the status quo protects anyone. It doesn't protect anyone. And those who wish to ignore the law, as they have always done down the ages, can go to Switzerland, can troll the internet for the drugs to kill themselves. It's not protecting these people either. So the law, the status quo, frankly, uh, the uh, risk of sounding insulting, and I don't mean to do this, is the coward's way out. This bill is serious. This has to be considered because of what Bob said, not because of what Sheila Duffy says or what Patrick Harvey says or what Margaret MacDonald says, but because it's the right thing to do to support this. In a civilised society, the way that we treat our elderly, the way that we treat our ill is very important, and the way that we treat our disabled. I will defend Gordon's right to the end to have maximum palliative care, maximum tubes, drips, oxygen masks, if that's what he wants for himself, his family, his members. I am arguing that we need choice. I don't want that for me. And in a civilised society where we regard and respect autonomy, I want my choice. I'm defend Gordon's choice. Gordon's choice is quite right. Well, of course we must have more palliative care. But we must also, for those who are at the end of their life, suffering in intolerably, offer them this possible assisted suicide. I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in, uh, Dr Saunders. I'm going to bring Jennifer Buck in because she hasn't spoken, but uh, you'll get all the opportunity you need or you want. You. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you. We heard uh, earlier that the general public aren't informed about uh, the bill and how they feel about assisted dying because of celebrities and uh, the media, and it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. This is the people who are... Uh, we want this bill to, to pass through, and that's four out of five people in this country, have immediate uh, personal experience of family members, friends, who have suffered in such a great deal, in such a great way, that they didn't want them to go through that again. I'm actually a nurse, uh, and I've worked in hospitals in the community, and I've worked with people who have dreaded the time when living for them becomes unbearable. I have sat on people's beds and held their hands and they have asked me every single day for weeks, please, can you please help me to go? And you can't. You've just got to sit by their bed. And families who've come up afterwards and said, I can't believe the torture that my relative has gone through. That is the experience that people have in this country. That is why this bill has to pass. Dr Saunders. I want to comment first on, yes. on the current law, because we often hear that the law is a fudge or isn't working. But I think the law that we have at the moment in, in the whole of the UK, which gives a blanket prohibition on all assisted suicide and euthanasia, is clear and it's right and it is working. And the evidence that it's working is firstly that we see a very uh, small number of cases going to, uh, going to places like Dignitas, about 15 to 20 per year from the whole of the UK. And you put that up against 500,000 deaths in the whole of the UK each year. It's an absolutely minuscule percentage. And uh, the other evidence is that we see very few prosecutions. And the law is, is working because, on the one hand, the penalties that it holds in reserve provide a very powerful disincentive to exploitation and abuse and make people think twice. And at the same time, it gives discretion both to prosecutors and to judges to be able to temper justice with mercy in, in hard cases, uh, at, at, if you like, to, to let the punishment fit the crime. It has, on the one hand, a stern face to deter abuse. On the other hand, it has a, a kind heart to deal compassionately with difficult cases. And the best kind of laws, the easiest laws to defend, are those which are, are, are very clear if you're, for example, if you're defending a country, then it's far easier to defend the borders if they fall alongside natural geographical features like mountain ranges or rivers. Difficult to, to, and in the same way, the laws that are most easily defended are those that have blanket prohibitions but give discretion to prosecutors and judges. That's the situation that we have at the moment in the UK. Once we change the law, 
and create exceptions, then uh, we will find that people will push the boundaries. It's not about slippery slope. That, that implies a passive process. It's about incremental extension or mission creep. It's about individuals pushing the boundaries of a new law that allows uh, these exceptions. And the problem is that the two major arguments used to advance this legislation, which are autonomy and beneficence, the problem is that those two arguments of autonomy and beneficence apply not just to physician-assisted suicide or assisted suicide, but also to euthanasia. They apply equally. Whether it's lethal ingestion or lethal injection, they apply equally. And they also apply to people who fall outside the already broad range of categories to be included within this bill. Because there are people who do not have terminal or life-shortening conditions who actually would like to die uh, for, for whatever reason. And once you create an exception for any people at all, once you create a right for some people, you're immediately, <coughs> I think, setting yourself up for, um, for new hard cases to come along that challenge the boundaries of that under equality legislation. And, and as we've seen in places like uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, you get a, a gradual weakening and broadening of the categories of people. So the best law to have is one which is clear, uh, gives a blanket prohibition, but gives discretion to prosecutors and judges, as evidenced by the small numbers going to Switzerland and the very small number of prosecutions we have here. <coughs> you, 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 Colin Key has asked for a question. I'm just saying this for Dennis. they have asked for a question. Supplementary on Dr Saunders' yeah, response. Thanks very much, convener. Um, I've listened very carefully to what's just been said here, and I do understand the categories of people who are being discussed. However, the one group of people who obviously haven't really taken into view here is the, are the ones who actually just go ahead and commit suicide in terms of numbers. You're talking about the people who go to Dignitas as being a small number. Usually the people who can afford to go to Dignitas is really what what you're saying. Now, there's got to be a group there who say, I'm not taking any more and take their own life. And do we have numbers for uh, these sort of, these people who do such a thing? Because, it, you know, it, it, I think we need to know those numbers alongside the Dignitas numbers to work out exactly what is happening, because an awful lot of people will do that. Do you have a response to this one? Oh, yes, please. Well, well, we do, we do know the numbers, because they've been calculated. We know 15 to 20 per year go from the whole UK to Dignitas. We know that with an Oregon-type law in the whole of the UK, we'd have about 1,300 deaths a year. With a Dutch-type law, which allows both euthanasia and assisted suicide, we would have 13,000 deaths per year in Britain. So the, the current law is certainly restricting the number of, of cases the number of suicides is much less than that. And, and I think what we need, really need to grasp here is that, is that this, is about not, uh, the, this is not about the condition of the person. It's about the person with the condition. So you can have two people uh, take the two rugby players, Matt Hampson and Daniel James. Daniel James, uh, paralysed, finds his life intolerable, goes to Dignitas. Matt Hampson with an even worse disability on a ventilator is an inspirational speaker going around schools who did everything he could to, to change Daniel's position. So we've got to understand that this is very much about the, uh, the person with the condition and their, and their attitude. And it's not about unbearable suffering or pain. In, in Oregon, just 23% of people cite pain or even fear about future pain as the means, uh, as, as the reason for ending their lives. It's well, well down the list of categories. Number one is autonomy, 93%. Number two is loss of enjoyment of life, 89%. Number three is loss of dignity, 73%. In Washington, the neighbouring state, 61% uh, end their lives because of fear of being a burden. Uh, the figure in Oregon is 49%. 
Now, these are not physical symptoms. These are existential symptoms. These are, these are symptoms about loss of meaning and purpose. And I think to take the step to uh, allow people to have, uh, to ingest lethal drugs for, for what are, in a sense, existential symptoms, uh, most of which could be uh, improved by good palliative care or much better support, uh, would really be the ultimate abandonment. Dr Scott. Thanks, Mr. <coughs> I think I might be able to help um, Ms Akir uh, with some information closer to home. Um, figures extrapolated from research carried out in England by Demos through the coroner system would indicate that around 50 people a year in Scotland with terminal conditions choose to end their own lives each year at present. That's one person a week. Now, we have anecdotal information pointing towards many of these deaths being violent in nature. I'm happy to provide the committee with the source of that information, should you wish. Sheila Duffer. Peter Saunders made about the, the two rugby players, which is um, very relevant, is that it actually under, um, underpins what we are arguing for, and that is for choice. Some people will choose to carry on with perhaps multiple disabilities, perhaps able to suffer more pain than others. Some will just reject that choice, and they don't want it. Daniel James tried to kill himself several times before his parents agreed to go with him to Dignitas. I have um, grown-up children who are roughly his age. I can't imagine how heartbreaking that was to support their son and go to Switzerland and come back and find on the doorstep two policemen do, going to question you about your motives. Is that the kind of civilised Scotland we want? Is that the kind of civilised society we want? You know, we must protect our vulnerable, our elderly and our weak, but we must also give them choice uh, over their own suffering over their own future and at the end of life as well. Dr MacDonald. I mean, it, what this boils down to is the issue of autonomy versus the issue of protecting the vulnerable. Um, we, we had a report in the press this week um, about a couple of cousins from Troon who went to Switzerland for what reason? Not because, as far as the press reports are concerned, they were terminally ill or they had some sort of chronic illness, but essentially because they were fear, feared being lonely. They feared being split up and sent to different nursing homes. Um, and I think that, you, you know, the, the, the question we fundamentally have to ask is, are we content to move to a society where choice is the absolute public good? And therefore, you because if that is the case, then you don't put a restriction on it. Sheila McLean has said in previous debates that I've heard her speaking out, she's argued for autonomy and for extending it to other groups, including euthanasia, because, because her founding principle is autonomy. And if that is your founding principle, then you should not be saying, well, it should be restricted to the terminal, it should be restricted to people with a chronic condition. Why, why, is, why would it be wrong? Um, for people who are lonely to go and commit suicide or to be given assistance to commit suicide, which is what we're talking about. It's about the state, through the medical profession or through other professions, providing assistance to people to commit suicide. Now, that runs contrary to everything that Scottish Government and other public agencies' suicide prevention policies are about, which is saying, you know, don't give up. Life is worth living. It can be improved. Um, and so you're sending out mixed messages. And what, what you would be doing is you would be saying well, actually, your life isn't worth living, and we are going to um, a, a endorse that view and encourage you to, to go and commit suicide rather than say to you, no, hold on a minute, that's not the case. You are valuable. You have intrinsic worth, and there are people who, um, you know, who, who love you. And it was interesting that the cousin, uh, sorry, the nephew in, in that case, according to the press report, said that he would have tried to discourage them from, from doing so if he had known about it, but he didn't know about it until after the event happened. So that, I think, highlights where this legislation might go. Peter talked about it being extended. Margot MacDonald herself said that she expected that it would be extended to include other categories of people later on. And we are really crossing the Rubicon with this if we, if we introduce it. Um, so I would um, you know, urge the committee to think very carefully and not, not to take this step. Dr Scott. Thank you. 
We have met representatives of Choose Life organisation and we fully support the Scottish Government's suicide prevention strategy. Now, our natural response, probably everybody around this table and beyond, to the very word suicide is to recoil. For we're conditioned to regard it as a mistake and a tragedy, and rightly so. When suicide comes about as a consequence of mental illness or overwhelming emotional turmoil, how could that not be? It's the few remaining cases which challenge our understanding, those that are carried out by sane individuals who have calmly decided to end their lives because of incurable illness and unbearable suffering. And I think that, that there is a need for us to recognise that such action can be appropriate, even if, and here comes the tricky bit, even if that conclusion runs contrary to our personal values. Showing tolerance, another concept which I think lies at the heart of this bill, showing tolerance towards the measured conduct of others of which we do not necessarily approve is surely the hallmark of a truly civilised society. Dr Saunders. We all cherish autonomy and we, we're all thankful that we live in a democratic society which respects autonomy. But we also recognise that there are limits to autonomy and that we're not entitled to exercise freedoms which undermine or endanger the reasonable freedoms of others. That's why we have laws. That's why you're here to, to, to craft those laws, because every single law on the statute books stops uh, some person doing what they desperately might uh, want to do. But the problem is that once you change the law to allow assisted suicide in any circumstances at all, you inevitably place pressure on vulnerable people to end their lives out of fear of being an emotional or financial or care burden uh, upon others. And you place pressure on vulnerable relatives as well. And, and those particularly affected are the elderly, the sick, uh, the depressed, those with disabilities. And particularly at a time of economic recession when many families are suffering and when welfare cuts are being made and you'll hear from Inclusion Scotland later today about the effect on disabled people of having welfare withdrawn and the pressure that that raises. Uh, th these pressures can be very intense indeed. Now when we look at the Oregon figures, remembering that Oregon is a, a very wealthy northwest state, we find that in, in, in Oregon 6% of people um, cite the financial cost of treatment as a reason for having assisted suicide. In, in uh, Washington, nearby Washington, it's 13% cite the financial cost of treatment. In Oregon, a few years ago, there were, were two patients, um, Barbara uh, Wagner and uh, Randy Stroop, both of whom applied to the Oregon Health Department for uh, chemotherapy treatment for their cancers. Both of them received letters saying, we're sorry, but we can't fund your chemotherapy. However, we, we will fund your assisted suicide. Now, they thought that was quite interesting because neither of them had asked for that. But th the point is that once you legalise assisted suicide, then you make assisted suicide a treatment option for this range of conditions. That means that a doctor, a GP, is obliged to present it as a treatment option. But far more importantly than that, as a treatment option, it gets costed. And when you put the cost of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, perhaps tens of thousands of pounds uh, cost, against the cost of palliative care or hospice care, three or four thousand pounds a week, against the cost of a glass full of barbiturate, five quid, then it is inevitable that there will be pressure to take the cheapest treatment option. And do we want to put that choice of costed treatment options up against families who are struggling and perhaps suffering welfare cuts, uh, up against health administrators who are allocating and paying for different forms of treatment, up against doctors? That's, that's not somewhere that we want to go. And, and the problem is that the, the, the cost of this will be a major driver, I believe, to steer people towards suicide who, had they had adequate support or care, 
uh, would not have chosen that option. In other words, it's not a real choice for them. They're going that way only because they feel they have no other choice open to Sheila them. Sheila Duffy. Treatment option, um, I just don't see that happening in Oregon. The palliative care and hospice movement in Oregon would put us in this country to shame because it's amongst the best in the United States. Well, I do not see a disconnect between palliative care and assisted suicide. It's almost as if uh, when you open up this whole discussion about, and death is the final taboo, you can ask somebody how often they have sex you, and they'll tell you that you can ask somebody what they earn and they will tell you, ask somebody what arrangements have you made for your funeral or have you discussed your death with your children? They won't, oh, I'm not going to do that, Road Hen, no, no. It is the final taboo, and if nothing else, if this bill does nothing else, I honestly believe it will, A, open up the discussion about death and end-of-life choices and what mum or dad or husband or wife or son or daughter does or doesn't want, but also will say, well, why should this person opt for assisted suicide? In any country of the world, Netherlands, the palliative care system is much, much better than what we have here. So I don't see it as an either or an or. I think it that goes in hand in hand and that palliative care, care and hospice care will improve if we pass this bill. It's, it's, it's not, you know, given the evidence we've had, you know, I suppose that the, the treatment of, uh, option and uh, is that part of treatment. Um, and the end of life palliative care those who are, who are involved in that, who do encourage talk about death and dying, and it's their job, they're, they're almost completely opposed to this bill. You know, the hospice movement and, and, and others are, the evidence is very heavily against the, the, this bill. You know, you know why, why is it then that if you say that they're complementary, that, that suite of choices that the palliative care and end-of-life people who are, who are involved in that are almost... The, heavy, the evidence is heavily, heavily against the bill. You know, that's just... Very vociferous people who work in the hospice movement and the palliative care movement who, who are against this. But, I mean, Jennifer's a nurse. I mean, you've been on the, at the cold face. I mean, what is the reality... Okay. <laughs> Go for it. I was actually fortunate enough to be asked to do the guest lecture um, at Ardgown Hospice just in November in Greenock. Um, and the topic was uh, humanist pastors within, within the hospice situation. But we did actually come round to talking about the assisted suicide bill because people knew I was involved in it. Um, to say that the majority of people in, who worked in the hospice were against this bill uh, actually in Greenock is wrong. Um, they, we we'd had a huge discussion about palliative care and how brilliant it is in this country, but there are a tiny number of people that it's not for. And for that tiny number of people, these people are suffering. And a lot of the time, because I was a nurse, but I'm now a humanist celebrant, a lot of the time I'm conducting these people's funerals. Um, I've conducted the funerals of very high-profile <laughs> cases in the past year of people who have taken their own lives together. Um, and the family afterwards have had to answer to the police, answer to the prosecutor fiscal, and it's made a bad situation much, <clears throat> much worse for the people who were suffering initially. So to say that the, everyone involved in the hospice uh, service is against this bill isn't quite true. I don't think, not, not for me to follow up with my constituent here in public, but um, I, I, would be very, I would be very careful um, of, of, of suggesting that giving a hospice is for this bill. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, because I've had representation and they're clearly not, I've been along at the hospices and everything else. But I, but I was referring to the evidence that the committee has had and lots of that evidence from that section 
is heavily against the bill. It's, it, I'm not making a point, my own point, or my personal point. I'm just reflecting on the evidence that, that we have that, that, that we have had. Um, but Dr. Macdonald. I, I think, um, in terms of palliative care, the UK is, is world leading on palliative care. Um, I'm not, I don't know the situation. Oregon may very well have good palliative care as well, and I know that certainly the assisted suicides are not happening in the, in the hospices in Oregon, but we are world leading. So the UK, without assisted suicide law, has developed very good palliative care. That doesn't mean it can't be improved, and you heard last week that, you know, particularly in, in the general hospitals, in, you know, there is a need, and in the community there is a need for improved palliative care, improved training, etc. Um, but, but I don't think that we should say that um, you know, just because a place has good palliative care that, that that's an argument for legalising assisted suicide at all. Um, in terms of the hospice movement, most people in the hospices are opposed to this, as you've, as you've commented on it. And the reason is because they can see what can be done with good palliative care. And often it's people's fear of the unknown because they've not experienced good palliative care that pushes them to articulate a view that they wish that assisted suicide could be legalised. I'm going to, I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to, because I've got MSPs that are getting, you know, a bit, a bit edgy to get in now, and it may take us on to other questions. I'm going to try and take some of those in. Uh, I should also give notice that we do intend as a committee to look at palliative care, because it's all very well saying that it's great and it's good, it's whatever. It hasn't been reviewed since 2008, and, you know, there are issues there that we would wish to examine as a committee. But Dennis Robinson asked to get in and ask a question a long time ago, Dennis. Uh, thank you. Um, probably, uh, I think the question I was going to ask uh, conveners has, has been covered. So, um, perhaps uh, on the first instance, just the discussion we've just had, uh, uh, Dr. Scott said this morning in terms of the palliative care and, and the bill was as a spurious argument. So maybe you would like to sort of um, uh, explain what it means by this a spurious aspect of, of the argument uh, from his uh, interview this morning. But the, the, the question that I think I would really like to sort of consider, uh, convener, is the, the human right aspect. Um, we have a right to life. You know, that's enshrined in law. Um, do we have a right to death? Do we have a right in how we die? Um, because if we do, and if we sort of move forward with this bill, you know, um, does it then open up the door um, to people who perhaps believe that they want to die? And, and I've had many, many, many experiences of people saying, I would rather be dead than have this condition, or I would rather be dead than. Uh, and they don't really mean that. But I'm just wondering if, if the bill in itself opens that door. Do these people who make these sort of comments initially because of the change of circumstances, um, would they maybe opt for this, uh, the, the assisted suicide? But perhaps just convener, maybe Mr Scott would want to uh, answer the, the spurious aspect first, <laughs> then open it up to the human rights. You're suggesting some of the evidence that we received that suicide is a human right, I think, but some of them... Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, Dr Scott, do you wish to respond? Yes, indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. I welcome that opportunity. And I speak as a, a retired general practitioner who, during his working life, had a special interest in end-of-life care in the community with my patients. Um, I think the, the spurious nature I was trying to clarify is that I see no conflict between what is being proposed in the bill and appropriate palliative care. I think they are capable of coexisting comfortably. And I acknowledge that that is quite a big leap in understanding and recognition. And I put my hand up myself and say that my position has changed. I didn't previously believe what I now believe to be the case. I was against this. But the weight of evidence persuaded me that it was appropriate for this to go ahead. Now, that is not an implacable position. I may, in the future, change my view back again if the evidence persuaded me, but at present it doesn't. This is an exceptional provision that's being proposed, not a routine part of medical care. Exceptional response to exceptional circumstances. Anyone else? Oh, sorry, Dr Saunders. Just to come back to this issue of, of palliative care, 
We know that in all surveys, between <laughs> two-thirds and three-quarters of doctors are opposed to a change in the law, and as I said, the BMA and most of the Royal Colleges are opposed. But what's always been striking is that when we look at palliative medicine specialists, it's disproportionately high. At the time of the Joffe Bill in 2006, it was 95% of palliative medicine specialists who were opposed. And I think we've got to ask ourselves why that is. Why is it that these people who spend uh, all of their time with the kind of folk who would be regarded as being within uh, the remit of this bill, why are they most opposed? And I think there are two main reasons. I think the first is that people dealing with the dying understand the vulnerability of dying and disabled people in a way that other doctors don't because they're spending a, a lot of time with them. They understand the family dynamics, the subtle pressures that families can put on people. They see their vulnerability. They see them often making choices because they feel they have no other choice, and they recognise the need for legal protection for people. But the other reason is that palliative medicine specialists know exactly what to do with all kinds of different symptoms, whether it's physical symptoms like pain or nausea, whether it's feelings of social exclusion, whether it's spiritual problems of lack of meaning and purpose, they're, they're trained specifically to deal with, with these sorts of things. And uh, it, 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 it tends to be... That a lot of the push for the change in, in the law is coming from the worried well rather than from really uh, sick people. In fact, the percentage of people who are, are dying who want euthanasia-assisted suicide is much lower than the general population, and that's because when people see the care that they can have and experience good care, they change their minds. You'll recognise my accent's not Scottish or English. I come from New Zealand. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues in New Zealand looked after the president of the Voluntary Euthanasia Society there in his final days with a, with a terrible cancer that was uh, very difficult to control the symptoms of. And this man never, ever requested it right up until the very end that anyone would prompt him because he saw the care that he could give. In fact, he was quite anxious that because of whom he was, someone might uh, do, do the deed uh, for him. Uh, Rob George, who is one of the leaders of the Association for Palliative Medicine, works for our, uh, speaks on behalf of our movement, says that in a lifetime of managing 20,000 cases of dying people, he could count on the fingers of... Uh, his two hands, the number who had persistent ongoing requests to, uh, to, to, to end their life or to die. In other words, the, vast major the overwhelming vast majority, once they experienced what good care was, wanted assisted living, not assisted dying. They wanted care until they died, not uh, an assisted death. And, and the, the question that we're left with is, do we change the law for this very, very small group of desperate and determined people? Do we change the law to allow them to kill themselves? And, and the argument is, is a balance of, of harms. No, we don't, because it would simultaneously remove legal protection from a gr much larger number of, of vulnerable people. Sheila Duffy wants to come in as well, Dennis, and then, of yeah. course, I'll get back to you. Yeah. Just on the question of, of most doctors and most... Uh, medical health care professionals are against this. It is very difficult if you're a practicing doctor to come out and say I'm in favor of this because you do get labeled uh, Dr. Death. The actual statistics though uh, I think prove that there are, there are lots of uh, doctors, retired doctors, um, Charles Warlow, Graham Cato. I mean I've, I've got a list a mile long that I can tell you. I'm old enough sadly to remember when doctors were bitterly opposed to the introduction of the National Health Service. Bitterly opposed to it. We will go to hell in a handcart. Free care, free health care for everyone. Are you mad? Who today would not defend, albeit with all its faults, our wonderful National Health Service? You know, doctors, this is too important, frankly, to leave to doctors. And I actually d don't believe that uh, most doctors are opposed to it. Many of them have to sit on the fence. There's no doubt. Some are. Of course some are uh, opposed to it, and, and I respect their views as well. But, you know, this is far too important to leave to doctors to decide to. Gosh, that would, I mean, Bob, I'm sure you find today, it's more, you've said to me when we've been talking about this, it is more difficult today to get a good death than it was when you trained as a young doctor because doctors have to look over their shoulder in case people clive on them. 
Dr Scott, I think that's your cue. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I, I would maybe broaden it out just a touch um, and uh, refer the committee to a 2011 survey. And I apologise for these statistics. The same information is used by both sides in this debate, but for what that's worth, here goes. There was 1,000 uh, GPs in the United Kingdom surveyed asking them what they would want to happen to them were they to find themselves in a position where they were suffering intolerably. And it fell neatly into three compartments. One third said that they certainly would wish to have the option of assisted dying. A third said, no thank you. And a third said that they didn't know what they would do. So to present the medical profession, including palliative care specialists, as being uniformly against this is a misrepresentation of the reality. And if I fudge that on a personal basis, my apologies. Uh, Dr. MacDonald, and then I'll get back to Dennis. The use of the term intolerable suffering yeah. is, you know, uh, not um, neutral, let me put it that way, and it's also not well defined, of course. Um, I, I wanted, though, to comment on. Uh, uh, the, the issue about human rights. Uh, you're right, there is, a, there is a right to life in ECHR, um, and that right to life um, is, is a foundation, really, of human rights. Um, and it didn't come from nowhere, of course. You know, the ECHR came out of a context in which that right to life had been grossly and systematically abused. Um, there is no right to death, and the European Court of Human Rights has, has always refused um, cases that have been brought to it on that basis, or right to control death and the circumstances of death. Um, death is an inevitability. In some ways, it's not something that people would wish a right to, or most people would wish a right to. People would wish to avoid it. Um, um, and we have to um, be aware of the fact that, you know, the, the, where people seek to control t the timing and circumstances of death, that the, the um, fallout of that may very well be to, to deny other people their right to life. And that is why we would say that the right to life of the many has to be put, given precedence over um, the demands of some people um, to control the timing and the circumstances of their death. And indeed, um, the, the evidence from Oregon shows that in many cases, the people, even once they are given the lethal dose of drugs, do not take the drugs. Um, that um, is, is uncontested. And so clearly, even in that situation where they have the drugs in the cupboard, they still don't want, um, in many cases, to go ahead with the act of suicide. Dennis? Uh, you, yeah, and I think we've just sort of explored there, you know, we've got this right to live, but uh, sh should we not rebalance that and, and give people the, the, the right to how they, they wish to die? Um, and it's not because maybe they're having an into intolerable pain or, or whatever. Uh, they just feel that their choice is that they wish to end their life uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and I'm just thinking, you know, is, should we look at that as a basic human right, as we did as a, a basic human right to life? Well, I think if, you, if you move towards that um, position in law, then the problem is that you undermine other people's right to life. Um, and although, um, you know, you, people may express that desire, you've got to look at everything else that's going on in their life. Are they clinically depressed? Are they feeling that they're a burden on their family and their friends? Is the inheritance being used up by care home fees? You know, you've got to look at what, what the other circumstances are and say, well, is this um, a, a considered, informed and reasonable position to take? And more to the point, is it reasonable for the state to encourage people down that line? Um, and if the state does encourage people down that line, what is, the, what is going to be the consequence in terms of the culture in medicine, the culture in our society? Um, the evidence from the Netherlands, I know this bill is not exactly the same as the, 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 the Dutch legislation, but the evidence in the Netherlands is that there has been a shift in the culture, um, in the medical culture. So you have a, a situation where 12.5% of deaths are through terminal sedation. They don't feature in the euthanasia statistics which have gone up every year in the Netherlands. We now see disabled infants being euthanized in the ne Netherlands. We don't, you know, the culture has changed um, and that I suppose is our concern. And Oregon is a different scenario but at the end of the day if you change the medical and wider culture then the pressure will be placed on people. Dr Scott. 
Very brief point. Very brief point, Chair, and I hesitate to stray into the field of the law well beyond my expertise. And I'll just comment here to say that a majority of the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, has recently indicated that the current blanket ban on assisted suicide either is incompatible with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights or may well be so. I leave that with the committee and other experts to clarify. <coughs> Well, well the, the, the Supreme Court said that Parliament should decide the matter. That's what they said. And obviously this Parliament has decided the matter in the past and is considering it again Which is where we are today. Yeah. We are indeed. <laughs> Jennifer Buchan. I'd like to say to Dennis, I think everyone has a basic human right to a good and a peaceful death. Um, and as someone who works at the chalk face, as we are, for a lot of people, that doesn't happen. Um, I do the funerals of people who have had a very violent death. They have taken their own lives. They've been alone. Um, and they have they've committed suicide, and, and they have been alone. And they've had a very traumatic death. No one should have to do that. Sheila Duffy, and, and then I'm going to take Bob Doris and move on. Gordon made a, a, a very good point talking about the, these uh, twins in, in Troon, that if their nephew had known, um, he would have tried to stop them. And, and this, I think, puts a lie to the misunderstanding that if you're wealthy uh, and coming towards the end of your life, your children, your nieces, your nephews will put pressure on you to go. I, I'm, I have not seen this at all. In fact, one of our members who went to Dignitas, Nan, who had a very large house in Chelsea, was very wealthy. She specifically said to us, please don't tell my daughter <coughs> that I'm going to do this. She was racked with pain. She had osteoarthritis because she will try and stop me. And yes, of course, there are bad guys in the world. We know that. But, you know, most people want their parents, their loved one, to go on. They want to encourage them. I was thinking of my friend... Uh, David, who died of motor neuron disease last year, he did everything in his power and his family helped him to try and combat uh, motor neuron disease and he travelled down to London for trials and tests and things uh, to try and prolong his life. And, you know, I don't see this vision of the family saying, oh, well, it's your time to go. My mother went through two wars and a depression and if I'd said to her, is it no time, you've got a good post office book, it's time you went, she would have gone... I'll make up my own mind, thank you very much, when it's time for me to go. That's, these are the 80 and 90-year-olds I mix with. Uh, I don't see all these, uh, you know, and, and as I say, uh, Gordon said, the nephew said, I would have tried to stop them. This is what I find amongst families. They don't want their loved ones uh, to leave, and they don't want their loved ones to have to resort to this. And frankly, going to Dignitas is not a joyful experience. It is a horrible experience. What people want is a dignified death in their own house, with their loved ones around them, perhaps with a glass of Lagavulin in their hand or iron brew or something like that. That's what people really want. That's why it's so important to, dis to discuss this and support this and say this is what a civilised society would offer the very few people who would take advantage of it. Bob Doris. Um, thank, thank you very much, Convener. Last week's session and, and this week's session, we're getting a lot of kind of individual direct experiences but then that leads us both last week and this week to generalisations been given in, 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 in my opinion um, it, there are individuals and family dynamics which will be very different depending on where you are and I think that gets lost a little bit in terms of those who perceive themselves as a burden not who are a burden I think the figures given at committee today was in Oregon it was 49% of those that through assisted suicide saw themselves as a burden, whether they were or weren't, and I think it was 61% in Washington. I apologise if I've got those figures wrong. I, I, I scribbled them down based in, 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 in the session. Um, we've also heard in the session, um, I think the word exceptional, this will be for exceptional circumstances, I think we've heard that, and we've heard the expression tiny, num tiny numbers of people. So we have to compare that when we're testing evidence with what the bill says. And what the bill says is the bill provides those with certain illnesses or conditions who will be eligible to seek an assisted suicide, eligible ind individuals will be those with an illness that is for the person either terminal or life-shortening, or a condition that is for the person progressive and either terminal or life-shortening. That doesn't sound like tiny numbers of people to myself, 
And I would be interested to know if anyone's done projections for how many people, in theory, not in actuality, would fall within that scope. I think that's, that's important to know, um, because we have to test that against tiny numbers of people and exceptional. And for it to get to tiny numbers of people and exceptional, we also have to look at if this does become law, and it could become law, um, is whose job would it be to offer the treatment choice? And we've heard of that before. If someone goes to their GP and he goes, this pain's really bad, I'm not sure if I can go on, should that GP be duty-bound to say, well, one of your treatment options are, if you go to the pharmacist and you have a chronic pain management uh, and pharmaceutical review and you say, this just isn't working for me, should the pharmacist uh, have to say that? If, you're, if, if you've got a nurse specialist dealing with your condition, should they have to say that? For many conditions, there's managed clinical networks and treatment options and choices along the way. Should it be part of that managed clinical network? I think that's important to know. Um, I don't think any of that's particularly within, within the bill. And when any law is passed, you normally need some form of public information campaign to make people aware of their rights. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't want to use the expression advertising, that's not what I mean, but people have to be aware of what rights they can exercise, and this would be a right if passed into law. So who would make people aware of those rights? Who in the medical profession should have to make people aware of it? And is there a danger, irrespective of people's views here, and there, I, I respect there's various different views here, are there dangers if we don't clarify the roles and responsibilities and the balances and whose job it is to inform people and whether that could compromise or conflict certain individuals involved in people's care? And I've deliberately not mentioned palliative care as part of that because I think that was well aired last week. Lots in there. And I would say virtually every week um, from the media saying, have you got somebody who's going to Dignitas? Could we follow them? Could we follow their story? And um, sadly, it is the Freddie Starr ate my hamster syndrome. And I, I come from that background and I don't defend that. But what, what we do find is that um, the press generally will report, perhaps over-report, uh, what is happening, what is available. This is a complicated bill. I mean, I've spent the last year of my life reading it and rereading it and thinking, oh, my God, how are they going to catch us out today or what am I not going to be able to answer? Uh, and it's, it's a bill that could well be uh, amended. Um, but basically, um, I, I have no worry about this. You know, the people who live in Govan, the people who live in Castle Milk, the people who live in Hilton, the people who live in Dundee won't be able to understand this. They won't, they won't be informed about their choices. The bill is very clear. It, you have to make your own declaration. It's not as if you go to your doctor and your doctor says, oh, I think this is for you. It's not as if you go to the pharmacist and the pharmacist. This is something that people will make a pre-declaration. They will have decided for themselves. And very ordinary people, you know, do uh, take their death very seriously. And as you get older, you take it more and more seriously, I can assure you. Um, that it's not something that you wake up one morning and say, oh, this is really painful, I'm now going to end it all. M most of the people I've known or met who've gone to Dignitas or taken their own lives have agonised about this, sometimes for weeks, months. I I'm not worried about the information. I think the information will go out through the press and, and through debates um, and public events that people will understand what is available why it's available, and the safeguards that there are for those who have misgivings about the bill. Dr Saunders. I think we need to be very clear <coughs> here that we're not talking about a right to die. We're talking about a right to kill oneself, to have help to end one's life. Now, that's a very, very different thing because when in order to give somebody a right to end their life you need to give somebody else the power and authority to be able to make that happen and the thing that concerns me most about this bill is and I say this as a doctor uh, knowing doctors is that it gives far too much power and not nearly enough accountability to doctors and it gives it to doctors who are not really in a position to make the, the judgments that the bill requires. Now, we're talking here about uh, busy uh, general practitioners who are under a lot of pressure, who don't have necessarily the skills of a palliative medicine specialist, 
are, are called and who don't have the, the skills of a psychiatrist who are being called to make judgments about patients they might have only just met, whose family situation they don't know, to assess their mental capacity when they might not have the ability to do that, to assess uh, undue influence, to make a judgment about whether a condition is, uh, falls within the, the broad range of conditions or whatever. There's a huge number of pressures. And, and, and I, I would say too that there are some doctors, and I'm, I'm talking just about a minority here, but there are some doctors who really scare me that if they were to have this power and authority, they would abuse it. And I don't see anything in this bill to stop, for example, a shipman who gets a taste for, for killing and authorising um, to, 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 to abuse this situation. And, and what, what, in order... The, there are not safeguards in this bill. There are eligibility criteria. And those eligibility criteria about the illness and capacity, all that sort of thing, can be stretched. And at the end of the day, it won't be even whether the patient fulfills it. It will be whether a doctor is prepared to put a tick in a box to say that they fulfill it. Now, what we've seen in the parallel situation, I know we're not talking about abortion today, but take the Abortion Act, which in 1967 uh, operates on the same system where doctors in good faith uh, say whether a, a patient falls within a category. It was meant to be for a very small number. We now have 8 million abortions in Britain, 200,000 a year. One in every five pregnancies ends in abortion, and 98% are done on mental health grounds, where a doctor ticks a box to say that the continuance of the pregnancy poses a greater risk to the mental health than uh, having an abortion, where, in fact, the Academy of Royal Colleges, having looked at this, said... That, 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 those men, that there's not actually evidence that that mental health ground ever applies. Now, my point is, and we've, I'm sure we've got different views on that issue, but my point is that once you give doctors the power and authority to be able to make a judgment to end life according to criteria and you don't have the teeth to hold them accountable, they will push the boundaries. And what worries me most about this bill is that there are the, the only provision there seems to be about keeping doctors accountable is one that, that lets them off. It's the section 24, the savings section, which removes culpability for incorrect judgments, inconsistent actions, as long as they're made in good faith. And it contains no penalties or abuses for careless errors, nor any suggestion about how they might be investigated. And I'm really worried about the, a, a small group of doctors uh, who, who will if this legislation would would be passed, would be enthusiasts for this and would be uh, difficult to... that they'd be given too much power uh, that they can abuse. And we've got to remember that many you've doctors made, you've feel... Made, you've made the point, yeah. you know, a couple of yeah. that, and, and it's caused some reaction, so I and, and, and need to encourage that. And, uh, Dr Scott and I've seen Sheila Duffy, and we've got about 15 minutes left in a session, so and I've got some others to get in. And, uh, Dr. Dr. Scott. Thanks very much, Chair. Very briefly, I don't recognise the description of medical practice that we've just heard from Dr. Saunders. Yes, there is a rebalancing of the relationship between doctors and patients implicit in this bill. Our view is that it empowers the individual. It's for the individual to decide if this is appropriate from them. Sheila Duffy. If I could just bring in this reference to Dr. Shipman, I really do think this is unnecessary hyperbole. This really is fudging the issue. What this bill needs, and it is a contentious bill, is cool, clear, pragmatic discussion looking at the evidence and looking at the statistics. Dr. Shipman was an unbalanced, drug-using individual who, you know, Nobody would defend any of his actions under any circumstances. And I think that just clouds the whole issue. And what we need is cool, clear heads to look at the uh, arguments for and against. Bob Doris back in, just to follow up on your uh, question. I think given the time we've got left... I'll, I'll just leave a comment sitting, because I, I want to give uh, Mr Harvey, who's you know, leading the bill, the opportunity with, with your discretion as well, convener. Um, and that is, I mean, I apologise to the politician for accusing all my witnesses for not answering the question I asked. Um, but that, that's what I felt. I actually asked about uh, what, what the, the, the safeguards, if you like, or what the protocols would be for when 
a GP or a pharmacist or a nurse specialist would get involved in that conversation? Would they lead it? Would they be passive within that process? Should there be guidelines over that? Should there be public information campaigns? And a variety of uh, concerns that I have, and irrespective of my personal views, it's for people to bring forward certainty in relation to that, and that's what I was hoping for. And I have to say, on neither side of the, the debate did I get any of that certainty. I thought that the Mr Shipman comment perhaps uh, did an injustice to some of the comments that could have been made in relation to, to some of the concerns I have. And Ms Duffy, with total respect, I don't think you engaged in the question. What you said is, it'll all be all right on the night. Uh, but, you know, far be it from a politician to uh, suggest that witnesses haven't actually answered the questions I asked, but I just want to leave that sitting there. On the night, because there are safeguards built into the bill. Uh, you know, the person has to raise the matter themselves. At the moment, if I go to my doctor and say, I'm in intolerable pain, I want an assisted suicide, he or she will turn around and say, this is something I'm, I can't discuss, please don't even raise this. At least, if we consider this, uh, Bill, then individuals will feel free to discuss with their doctor or their healthcare professional what their own feelings are. I mean, I'll, I mean I'll, read, I'll read back over the official report. I'm not personalising it to you, Mr. Dovey. I'm just giving my, my, my impression of, of, of the evidence is for, for based on the question that I asked, and I'll, I'll consider it all, all, all carefully. Thanks, Convener. Dr. MacDonald. Certainly, the evidence we've heard before from uh, health professionals is that they, they do raise the issue of suicide with patients when, when they are. Um, considering whether or not the person, well, trying to find it whether the person is suicidal, and that if you were to legalise this, that that would have an impact upon their freedom to have those discussions with patients. And the reason they have these discussions is um, because of suicide prevention um, strategies and the, and the need to discourage people, or the desire to discourage people from committing suicide. So if we put ourselves in the scenario where this bill is, 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 is been passed, and a doctor raises the issue of suicide with the patient, is the patient going to go away from that conversation thinking, the doctor thinks I should commit suicide? Or is the patient going to go away from that saying, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be having these suicidal thoughts? Um, and I think that's a, a dilemma which, which does need to be got to the bottom of. In terms of, of your point about who, who initiates the conversations and, and what processes are there, uh, I think the... It, it's, there, there's, there's a lot of process in the bill in relation to ticking boxes and signing forms, but there's no detail about you know, where the conversation comes from. Yes, a, a preliminary declaration has to be signed, but at what point does this preliminary declaration get signed? Who raises the discussion in the first place? It's not clear that, that there couldn't be a suggestion put to somebody. Um, Dr Shipman's case, I mean, it, it's... It's the extreme, isn't it? But it's a historical fact that happened. And in that case, there was a second doctor involved, or a number of second doctors potentially, who signed the cremation forms and didn't give due diligence to, to what they were doing. And that's what the concern is really, is that this just becomes a tick box, tick, tick box ex exercise. Um, I have family who, who work in general practice. General practitioners are under huge pressure at the moment, huge pressure. Um, and they have 10 minutes to see a patient. It's not even clear in this legislation that it will be the person's own GP that will be dealing with them. It might be a GP they've never met before. So I think there are significant issues to do with this proposal. Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Kazina. And I've listened to this morning very powerful argument statements. Can I turn to uh, what a, a statement Jennifer uh, Buchanan made earlier? Uh, and compliment all the nurses who work in hospices, hospitals, uh, and, and basically deal with uh, unfortunate death uh, people at the end, and you, you do give a lot of uh, comfort uh, to them, and I, I compliment you for that. But if I can come on to palliative care, um, we've had evidence uh, received by the committee that's claimed that some people cannot be helped uh, by palliative care, and that assisted suicide could be a complement to the care rather than the alternative. Do those opposed to the bill agree that palliative care has its limits, even though it's one of the, you know, we have uh, one of the best uh, palliative care uh, possibly in, in, this, in this country, but therefore uh, assisted suicide could be a complement to palliative care rather than an alternative. And even going back to the point that uh, Dr Gordon MacDonald made, is there any evidence that those with terminal and life-shortening conditions 
are currently using suicide as an end-of-life option. Do you want me to answer first? Ah, that would be good, Gordon, okay. yes. <laughs> Well, you, you go ahead. You, you, you two go ahead, and, and, and then it is. We'll have a we'll have a private um, discussion. So, Dr. McDonald, um, I don't want to spoil that cosy relationship there, and and, and uh, Dr. Dr. Scott. Well, I'm just no, no, then <laughs> then Dr. Scott. <laughs> Dr. I'm not a palliative care specialist, but the palliative care specialists that you had giving evidence are of the view that there is no place in palliative care for assisting people to commit suicide. Um, and I think you have to listen to the people who, who work in that area. No doubt we can still have good palliative care if we legalise assisted suicide. The problem is that with pressures on budgets, with pressures on the health service, with lack of training, etc., will people be given the access to the palliative care? Um, and I do welcome the fact that the committee is going to look at palliative care. There certainly was a, the, a debate a few years ago. There was a um, a bill which Rosanna Cunningham was proposing about whether there should be a statutory right to palliative care in Scotland. And I would certainly encourage the committee to, to look into that, whether or not we should be legislating for that. Um, but that's a, a debate for a different day. Um, I can't remember the second point that, that you made there. Sorry. Uh, is there evidence that uh, with terminal life shortening conditions, people are using suicide as an end of life option? Well, no doubt Sheila would be able to quote you a list of people for whom she, she would say that was the case. But, but fundamentally, the, the question we have to decide is, is, if some people are wanting to choose that option, what is going to be the negative consequence on other people? And if there is going to be a, a disadvantage to other people in terms of <coughs> putting them in a position where they feel under pressure, either internalised pressure or external pressure. And we heard last week from, uh, I think it was Baroness Finlay, about the, the case of... Um, the, the elderly lady who was being visited by her relatives and then they stopped visiting her and the reason they stopped visiting her, or the elderly lady indicated, was because her life insurance policy had run out. Okay. You know, so, that, so there are concerns about that and it's that, it is a balance here. Ultimately, um, you know, suicide is not a criminal offence or attempted suicide is not a criminal offence in this, in this country, but in Scotland, but assisting somebody to commit suicide is and, and we would say that that should remain the case. Dr. Scott. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Lyle, uh, I would repeat what I said earlier, that the evidence is that one person per week in Scotland who is terminally ill is committing suicide. That's at present. That's an extrapolation from figures in England. The other point I think uh, that's important to recognise that with regard to palliative care is that nowhere in the world uh, that most recently, the province of Quebec, which has enacted legislation to allow its citizens to manage their own death in one form or another, has, in the light of experience, seen fit to repeal those laws. And if, if the impact of the laws is so dreadful as the opponents to, to this legislation would have us believe, I wonder why that hasn't happened. Quebec has introduced legislation that combines palliative care and assisted dying. It's possible. Dr Saunders. Well, the, the Quebec uh, has, yes, but it's, it is, has not yet been enacted and it's being challenged as well. Uh, I mean, we could look over the border at the US where there are two states, Oregon and Washington, which have changed the law to allow assisted suicide. But we must remember that there have been over 120 attempts to change the law in other states and all of these have been defeated. And, and Oregon and Washington only changed the law on the basis of a referendum. Whenever it's been debated in a US state parliament, it's been defeated, even in, in, in those states which politically you think would have a balance which would be more open to this kind of thing. With regard to, to palliative care, we've got to remember that palliative care involves not just relief of physical symptoms, but physical care, social care, spiritual care. It's total person care. And we know that when people have their physical symptoms and their physical, social and spiritual needs properly met, that requests, even in countries which allow euthanasia or assisted suicide, are very, very rare indeed. And so that must put the onus on us to make sure not just that the very best care is available, but that it's made accessible to people and affordable uh, to people. Having said that, 
yes, there are a very small number of people who, despite all of the best palliative care, will still want to end their lives. But as I said earlier, the, the, the overarching reasons for them wanting to do that are existential rather than physical. It's about loss of autonomy, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of dignity. And uh, there are many other people in this country uh, who, who are not terminally ill or suffering any life-shortening condition who want to end their lives. Most suicides do not involve people who are terminally ill. And they're wanting to end their lives for exactly the same reasons about loss of enjoyment of life, loss of dignity, and so on. And I think we have to be very careful about the messages we're sending. We know about the dangers of suicide contagion, the Verter effect, and so on. And it's very, very difficult, on the one hand, to run an effective suicide prevention strategy, and on the other, to, to promote the idea that... Uh, that assisted suicide is actually a treatment option or an acceptable choice that we want to affirm for people who are wanting it, regardless of whether they're sick or not, for reasons of loss of enjoyment of life. I think that's a very dangerous road to go down. So, so we have to accept that with the kind of law we've got, giving a blanket prohibition, stern face, kind heart, discretion to prosecutors and judges, there will be some desperate and determined people who are not able to end their lives. But that's, I'm afraid, the price we have to pay in a democratic society in order to protect the much larger number of vulnerable, disabled and elderly people. I'm, I'm anxious to get Rhoda Grant and, 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 and need to get Patrick Harvey in and give him some time at the, 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 the end. Rhoda, uh, please. Um. Thank you, Convener. Can I refer members um, to my register of members' interest? Um, I have an intern from CARE and also from Inclusion Scotland on the next panel, so I want to put that on the record. Can I ask um, witnesses about um, conscience clause? We've had some evidence on this previously where the bill doesn't have a conscience clause and we've been told that that is not um, devolved and we can't have that on the bill. Could I ask witnesses how they would deal with this to ensure that people um, had, were able to opt out if they didn't want to take part in the bill um, in the future? Anyone? Dr Scott, Sheila Duffy, I see. Anyone else? OK, Dr Scott. Thank you, Chair. Our understanding is indeed that the bill doesn't include a conscience cause as it's beyond the powers of the Scottish Parliament to put that in. Um, however, it's clear in the policy memorandum that no doctor should be compelled to participate in the process. And it's well nigh certain that the General Medical Council, were this bill to pass, uh, modify its uh, regulation and standards uh, to doctors, taking into account the possibility of doctors not um, taking part in any part of this process. Sheila Duffy, do you I, I think Dr Scott's uh, answered the question you. there. Um, Dr MacDonald? Yeah, I mean, if there's not a conscience clause on the face of the bill, then there isn't legal protection. And it's not beyond the competence of the Scottish Parliament to engage in dialogue with Westminster, um, even post-referendum, to ensure that there might be a conscience clause. So I, so I think that you know, it's not acceptable just to say there's no conscience clause and we can't legislate for that. There has to be a conscience clause in legislation, and it has to be a robust conscience clause. The, the issue about um, other jurisdictions was raised. Um, the Northern Territories in Australia did legalise assisted suicide. That was then overturned by the federal government and the federal parliament. So it's not that there have not been places in the world where assisted suicide has been legalised and where it is now no longer legal, just for a point of record. Very briefly, Dr Saunders. The HFE Act... HFE Act the Abortion Act, Falkner's Act, all have conscience clauses in them. This one doesn't. It's essential that there is one. Uh, even when there are conscience clauses, there are arguments in court about the scope of them, the Glasgow midwives case. But uh, when there's no conscience clause, what happens is that the treatment that's prescribed becomes part of the full range of treatments required in that specialty, and there will inevitably be pressure placed on doctors, nurses and pharmacists. It's really essential. Thank you. Patrick Harvey. 
Thank you, convener, and can I thank all of the, the witnesses for their evidence, I think, supportive and, and uh, in opposition to the bill. I think we've had some uh, very interesting and reflective views. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a, a couple of points. Um, Dr Saunders, uh, a little while ago, made some comparisons with abortion and with the two-doctor signature requirement. Uh, and you said, uh, Dr. Saunders, that over the decades there had been a change in the way that's applied uh, compared with the expectation at the time. Can I put it to you that that change is more reflective of the more the, the wider change in uh, the provision of health care in this society, which has over the decades moved away from a, a sort of top-down authoritarian doctor knows best approach and toward a position which does reflect uh, the expectation that people should have the right to make choices on their own terms, uh, informed choices, and to be empowered to do so. Now, there are clearly some people who don't think that should be the case in relation to abortion. I'm perfectly happy to say I, I do think it should be the case in relation to abortion. But surely the concern you're reflecting there should only be relevant to this bill if you can present evidence that women are being subjected to abortions against their will. Well, my reason for raising the Abortion Act was not to get into a discussion about the ethics of abortion, because I'm sure there'd be a range of views. But I was just using it uh, as an analogy and saying that when the law was passed in 1967, it really had very strict safeguards, and the reason for that was to uh, you know, provide protection for the life of the unborn child. My point is that the law has not changed but the interpretation of it has, and that doctors now acting under good faith are uh, authorising around 98% of abortions uh, effectively outside the intended original scope of the Act. Now, the, my point is that once you, you allow a right to assisted suicide in certain circumstances, that kind of drift will happen, and we, we see that in the same way... <coughs> in the jurisdictions that have changed the law, US states of Oregon and Washington, Belgium and the Netherlands, that we see three key things happening. The first is an annual increment in the number of cases. The Netherlands, 10 to 20% per year of voluntary euthanasia cases since, 19, since 2006. The second thing is we see a widening of the scope. So it starts with the terminally ill, then it's the chronically ill. It starts with adults, then it's now children in Belgium. It starts with the mentally competent. It then shifts to the mentally incompetent, those with dementia. But the third thing that we see, and I think this is probably the most worrying thing of all, is that as time goes on, we see a change in the public conscience and the medical conscience. Now, that doesn't worry some people, but it worries me a lot that what happens is the public conscience changes and so that you then come to accept a situation that 10, 20 years ago you would have found intolerable. Now, most people are shocked about what's happening in the Netherlands and Belgium at the moment. But uh, there are many people in Belgium and the Netherlands, and particularly doctors, who are not shocked and don't see anything wrong with what's happening. And I think that change in the public conscience is, is something that happens once you change the law and people start to push the boundaries and, the, and it's not properly upheld. I'm sure there's no intention at all to conflate uh, accidentally a change in public opinion, a change of medical practice and a change in the law. Some of the, the changes that you've cited there fall into those three different categories. I would, I would, all I would, interact with each other I would and suggest shape each that other. The, the public opinion, the balance of public opinion is fairly clear already in favour of uh, uh, some form of change in the law toward assisted suicide. But the, the context in which you made those remarks about changing medical practice, changing attitudes amongst doctors, were related to uh, some quite extraordinary comparisons with, for example, Dr Shipman. And I think you, you said once doctors have the power, in my view this is about putting power in the hands of, of individuals, uh, about their own lives, not power in the hands of doctors. But you said once doctors have the power, they will push the boundaries. And your comparison with abortion surely is only accurate if that decision-making power is being taken away from patients and imposed on them by doctors. Can I suggest to you that that's not the case? Well, 
with abortion, uh, we might argue that the, the, that the legal protection has been taken away and the decision-making power from, from the person that's aborted. Well, so, so, and, and that's what I'm, we're... I'm prepared to indulge you, Patrick, in terms of the question directly put to uh, Dr Saunders, but I will take other bids, but I'm, I can't allow uh, uh, you know, to, to interrupt in one another. Um, the, uh, Dr, Dr Saunders, if you could quickly come to your point and, uh, and give... The, the point was Shipman. The point was Shipman. was not that all doctors are like Shipman. Clearly they're not. But the point is that even with a law which was very strong, someone clever like Shipman was able to get into a position with the collaboration of other doctors signing off drugs and uh, cremation certificates to get to the point where he could kill over 200 people. The point is that there are a few who will push the boundaries. And that's why we need strong laws that are very clear and specific and, most importantly, are properly safeguarded in that they have strong penalties in reserve to deter and to, to deal effectively with exploitation and abuse. And that's what we don't see in this bill. It's a bill with eligibility criteria but without strong legal safeguards to protect vulnerable people. I suspect all committee members would recognise that whether this bill is passed or not, whatever the law says, uh, if wicked people choose to break it, that's a, a serious matter. And that, that can, uh, as, as the example demonstrates, happen in the absence of any law on assisted suicide. Can I uh, pick up on something that Jennifer uh, Buchan uh, raised a while ago as well in discussion with yourself, convener, uh, about the balance of views within a profession? Uh, is it... Is it the case, would you agree with me, that the uh, range of organisations which represent, for example, medical professionals, lawyers, palliative care practitioners, uh, in many cases those organisations will take a position against a change in the law. But that's not necessarily reflective of the balance of views of people working in those fields. Is that the point that was, that was underlying that discussion that you were having with the community? That's exactly right. Um, within every organisation that has discussed this, even to the point where I had um, a member of the clergy come to me the other day and said, I hope all goes well at the committee meeting. And I said, that's great, thank you. He went, because I support the bill, but I can't say that I support the bill. Do you think that that simply relates to the, the fact that organisations and the, the stance that an organisation collectively takes... Uh, is, is, is part of the, the cultural norm, part of the, the status quo, and perhaps uh, some organisations, uh, not to, to make this as a criticism, but just a reflection of the way decisions are made collectively by organisations, might be inherently conservative to the status quo? Yes, definitely. I wonder if there are any other views on that matter. I don't know if there's any others. A great surprise that there, there might be some people who are members of the BMA or members of the Royal College of General Practitioners who, who might be in favour of this bill, or members of the Church's clergy in the Church of Scotland. You know, we, we live in a free and democratic society where people come to different views. But the point is that these institutions um, have considered the issue over a long period of time and come to a considered view which is supported by the majority of um, their members or of the people who are there. So, so I don't think we can say just because one Church of Scotland minister or one, uh, I don't know if it's Church of Scotland, but just because one minister or just because one doctor says this or, or a few people say that, that, that undermines the, the considered position of the organisation. Dr Scott, please. Thank yes, thank you. Point. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, just to clarify uh, what Dr MacDonald said, the Royal College of General Practitioners in 2013 consulted its members in, throughout the UK on assisted dying. There's 49,000 members, 1,309 of whom remained opposed to any change in the law. That's 2.6% of the total. That is presented as a majority. Well, how representative is that? Well, that's because 77% of those who did respond opposed of the 1,309 in absolute figures out of 49,000 members. 
Yes, but of those who responded to the survey, which was a voluntary survey, 77% opposed a change in the law. 77% of those who responded? Yes. Yeah. That's democracy. 2.6%. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not <laughs> no, there, you know, there is... I'm, I'm, sure that, I'm sure the committee are aware, and we have heard the evidence from individuals, you, you know, a, a XGP and others, but what I was referring to, and what we own... We are, we, the committee can refer to as the evidence that's pre presented to it. We have a representation from individuals and organisations, uh, and that's what we will be evaluating at the end of the day. You know, unfortunately, we can't, you know, take phone calls. Um, Partly, uh, you know, I will, I will, if you wish to ask any other questions, I put another one. Then I'm, I'm, I'm happy you should do that. You're very tight for time, convener. I, I think that the, the latter point about the difference between consultation exercises, democracy, and overall balance of public opinion is probably it speaks for itself. And uh, given the evidence we've heard, I think we understand the difference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your attendance, your valuable time, your written evidence. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to break at this, at this point, uh, suspend at this point, uh, till we set up for the next panel.
<coughs> we now reconvene um, and continue uh, with our agenda item number three, uh, stage one scrutiny of the assisted suicide uh, Scotland Bill. Uh, and we move to our second round <coughs> table of, of, of still morning. Um, um, so, first of all, can I welcome Richard? Um, threw me a bit there. <laughs> Uh, uh, can I first of all um, welcome you all generally. My name is Duncan McNeill. I'm the MSP for Greenland Linverclyde and Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Mary Neill, uh, Dr Mary Neill is our advisor uh, um, on, on the progress of this bill. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone, as I did in the previous session, to introduce themselves and then we can move to our first question. Yeah, good morning, I'm Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow and I'm Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, Sheila McLean, uh, Professor of Law and Ethics and Medicine at Glasgow University. Richard Lyle, MSP, Central Region. Catherine Farrelly, um, I'm a member of the Scottish Youth Alliance and I'm also a carer for my mum who suffers from primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Uh, Richard Simpson, MSP, Mid Scotland and Fife. Dr Peter Benny, I'm the Chairman of the British Medical Association in Scotland and my working job is as a consultant psychiatrist. Good morning, Colin Keir, uh, MSP for Edinburgh Western. Um, Sally Witcher, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Inclusion Scotland. Mike McKenzie, MSP, Highlands and Islands Region. Rhoda Grant, Highlands and Islands MSP. And good morning, I'm Dennis Robertson, MSP for Aberdeenshire West. Hello, I'm Tanis Muller, I'm the Parliamentary and Campaigns Manager for Parkinson's UK in Scotland. Lynette Milne, MSP for North East Scotland. Patrick Harvey, MSP for Glasgow, member in charge of the bill. Right, thank you all for that. Uh, welcome again. Can I move uh, directly to our first question, which is from uh, Bob Doris? <coughs> I've been exploring over the last few evidence sessions, and that's in relation to whether, if this bill is passed, it would have a medicalisation of assisted suicide. In other words, assisted suicide would be one treatment option. Uh, within a suite of treatment options for people uh, with with a variety of uh, life limiting c conditions, um, so I'd, I'd like some some views on that in relation to whether they think that is the case or not, um, and what safeguards could be put in place if it is the case in relation to whether and I used the, exp the, the example before whether GPs or pharmacists or nurse specialists or whoever should initiate a conversation with someone who makes it known to them that, you know, I don't think I can go on, I can't cope with this pain, should that then be presented at some point as a treatment option? And if it does, uh, how does that medicalise assisted suicide and other conflicts in that that can't be resolved? Or are there safeguards that can be put in place to, 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 to ameliorate my concerns in relation to it? I was kind of waiting for the microphone to come on, couldn't see if it was on or not. Yep. Um, maybe just start by stressing that in terms of the British Medical Association, we represent um, all branches of the medical profession. So that's GPs, hospital doctors, doctors in training, medical students and retired doctors. We've got clear policy against assisted dying and we would also be very strongly of the opinion that if this legislation were to proceed, it must have some form of conscience clause in it. In terms of this, this broader question that, that Mr. Doris is asking about if the bill comes into law, does that in effect mean that a discussion about assisted suicide could potentially be seen as being a, a necessary part of a, a discussion of therapeutic options? It does seem to me clearly that that is a, a significant possibility from the bill. However, if, as we believe is essential, there's a, a strong conscience clause in it, then that leads to real difficulties in how that would play out in practice, because you would have a group of doctors who would be protected by law from becoming involved in the process of, of getting involved in all of the, the statements and declarations that would need to be made. And you'd have another group who would not be in that, that category. And I think that would make it very difficult to actually have the 
the kind of broad discussion about therapeutic options that doctors would always want to have. Professor McLean. Thank you. Uh, I think in answer to that question, it is inevitable that this would have to be part of the ongoing discussion with patients about what their options were, in the same way as somebody coming into a clinician concerned about being pregnant and not wanting to be pregnant. Abortion is an obvious uh, discussion that, that needs to be had. Um, I think the point that Peter makes about some doctors not choosing to be involved in it uh, is important, but in, again, to use the abortion analogy, which I, I hate to do, but I think it's relevant here, um, the British Medical Association it's, uh, itself, and I believe the GMC, have made it clear to clinicians that if they are not prepared to participate in a pregnancy termination, then they have an obligation to refer to another clinician who might be prepared to do so. And I would imagine very similar uh, guidance would be issued in these circumstances. As to the question of medicalisation, the bill medicalises assisted dying by only authorising healthcare professionals to, to carry it out. So I don't think we can avoid the fact that it is medicalised, at least in, in terms of, of this bill. But it's medicalised only to the extent that it, in, that it requires clinicians where they are prepared to participate to respond to the competent, genuinely felt, often repeated request of an individual patient who's made that decision. Anyone else? Bob? Um, I... Did you... I'm just kind of tr trying to get my head around what the practicalities of, of this would be. Because I've heard a variety of, of, of evidence and, and, and on, on balance, um, maybe based on the stakeholder groups we've had around this table over the last few weeks of, of, of concerns in relation to how it could potentially undermine a, a, a relationship between a, a, a health professional or allied health professional and, and, and an individual who may have a transient desire, if that's the right word, to, to not go on at one period of time, but then that, that may change or fluctuate um, through the course of, of, of their experience, whether that's because they get better palliative care or the, 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 their mental and emotional health improves or, or varies, and that someone has to instigate, and unless the individual is completely aware that they have a right to sign this provisional declaration, they have to get that information from somewhere. Someone has to provide that information to them. And what I asked the last panel was, you know, when, when this becomes a public health issue, and I suppose it would become a public health issue, there's, there's public information campaigns, and you have to know where to go. So does that lead to promotion of... And I'm not, I'm not trying to, 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 to deliberately pick, pick issues or escalate issues that are not there, but I just want to be clear in my head how all individuals would equally be able to be aware that this is an option and how we could do that in a way that doesn't potentially undermine a relationship between a relevant professional and an individual. I'm going to give my apologies for, uh, to Dr Witcher and uh, invite her in at this point because she, she did try to catch my eye uh, to the previous question. But if you would like to address the further question, that would also be helpful before I take the others. Right. I, I will do my best. Um, I think one of the difficulties I have, though, is that in a way it's coming at it sort of further down the line when we have some objections to some of the more sort of fundamental starting points. But I think if I can pick up on your, your question about safeguards... Um, I think one of the problems is that, that it's very hard uh, um, to see where safeguards exist uh, within the bill as currently drafted in, in very many respects. Um, and you may want safeguards in very many respects. You might want safeguards to be clear about the particular group you're targeting when we've already heard about the number of you know, the, the evidence from other countries about the expansion that ensues in terms of numbers and coverage. Um, it could be... Um, in terms of uh, how do you challenge where something has you know, not happened as, it, as the bill intended, and the all-out cop-out clause, which basically says if it was done in good faith, if it was inconsistent and didn't go along with what we said, then that's fine. Now, how on earth are you going to prove that? Um, the conversation that happens between a, a GP and an individual, who knows what, what goes on there? I mean, where's the evidence? How is anybody actually going to see what goes on in that situation? Um, you know, ultimately, even if it were about bringing a case, would it ever be in the public interest? You know, what would you ever have the, uh, how would you know that it, relatives hadn't been pressurising that individual? 
Um, uh, you know, there, there's so many issues, and partly it's to do with the fact that, that people may come to a view um, about the quality of their life, which is to do with factors like uh, the experience of, of abject poverty caused by benefit cuts, you know, lo- you know, huge cuts to social care provision. You know, we heard from, um, the, I think, early on about Oregon, where the reasons why people went down this road, um, it wasn't to do with pain. It was to do with things like loss of dignity. It was to do with things like not being able to enjoy life anymore. And, and, and a large proportion as well, it was a fear of being a burden. And I think the point we would want to make is that, that none of these are necessarily inevitable. There seems to be, we talked about medicalization. Where there really is medicalization in here is about an, uh, this kind of uh, a straightforward assumption that a person who has a medical condition, a, life, uh, a life-shortening condition um, of, of some sort or another, must therefore have certain quality of life and, and that medical professions are best placed to, to, to kind of judge that. The reality is that you could have a very severe impairment and experience a very good quality of life, a very slight impairment and experience a very bad quality of life because what determines quality of life is not necessarily your, your condition, is to do with the kinds of services that you receive. You know, whether the services and support you get accord you dignity, autonomy, choice and control. You know, it's to do with whether you have the, the, the money, whether you're demonised in the press about the kind of attitudes you encounter, the kind of culture. You know, we've, we've got examples of where people are... Um, and, and, you know, it's not uncommon that, that, that people are, are having to survive... Um, in, in nappies overnight, you know, there's a particular case taken around this particular subject, um, and and you know, which some people earlier talked on about a civilized society. Now, the civilized society that we have today is one that thinks it's okay to leave people in that situation, that thinks it's okay for people to be, you know, relying on food banks in order to survive. Now, let's think about this. Now, if that's when also, if you're, if that's what you you confront. If that's what you confront as somebody who has a, a disability or an impairment, that's the, the reality of the life you experience and, and, and is, is you know, bullying in a care home, uh, you know, whatever it is, the fears and so on and so forth, the reality is going to be that, yeah, life's not going to look terribly attractive, is it? And maybe if you haven't got dignity, choice and control in the way that you live, well, dignity and choice and control about the way you die becomes really rather more important to you. But the point is, it's about getting, as the independent living movement has said repeatedly, it's about getting dignity, choice and control in, in, in the way people live their lives and, and supporting people to have the best quality life. So, you know, talking about safeguards, if you take your foot off that particular break, if you say, OK, well, it's fine for people, to, you know, they, they'll make the decision. Think about governments where uh, you have a situation that, that actually they're not particularly interested in supporting people to have a good quality of life because it costs a lot. Maybe their priority is about tax cuts for rather better off people. Well, uh, you know, it's one way of dealing with the pensioner time bomb, isn't it? You know, you, you don't do something to ensure people have good quality of life. Uh, you know, what you do is you say, well, they'll make the decision. Leave it to them, and they'll make the entirely sane, rational decision that this is not a life I want. This is why the numbers of disabled people support the bill, because we have daily experience of what it's like not to have autonomy, choice and control, dignity in the way that we, um, we experience our lives. But it isn't inevitable. That's my point. Um, Professor McQueen. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to go back to Mr Doris's question, if, if I may just... Um, I mean, I think the obligation, the, the discussion between doctor and patient is something which, which canvases all options. It's not for the doctor to say, I think you should choose an assisted suicide because, frankly, you're, you're a pain or you're a, a drain on my resources or whatever. It's for a doctor to say, here are your options. This is what I would recommend. That's what doctors do all the time when they're discussing with patients. So I don't see that it, it's a threat to the doctor-patient relationship in, in that sense. And bear in mind that after any discussion's been done, the person still has to run through the hoops that are presented by this legislation 
or proposed legislation of making declaration after declaration after declaration, which I personally believe is, is actually far too cumbersome, and given that other people can choose deaf by simply refusing life-sustaining treatment, but that's maybe a different discussion. Um, I, if I may, would it be permissible just to briefly touch on what was said um, by Dr. Witcher? Um, it is a a serious condemnation of uh, any society when people with disabilities are treated inappropriately, and I think your point is entirely well made. The question, the, the interesting thing though about Oregon is, uh, uh, that to use as an example quite regularly today, is that the vast majority of the people who opted for an assisted death in Oregon were cancer sufferers. Um, most of them were over 65, most of them were terminally ill with cancer. Oddly enough, against what people had anticipated, most of them were highly educated and three quarters of them were in hospice care or had, in a hospice programme at the time that made that request. So I think we need to take the, the, the concerns of um, the disability lobby very, very seriously indeed and, it, and something that we as a society need to look at. But whether this particular legislation would directly impact uh, on, on this particular group of people more than others, I, I'm, less, I'm less sure. Um, I just want to quickly come back to something that Sally says. Um, as a carer, I've experienced a lot of um, things to do with my mum in terms of like wheelchairs and things like that. And the way that people are treated does have a massive effect on their lives. For example, my mum, her wheelchair broke. She got a new wheelchair. It was not right. She phoned up and said, can you fix this? It was to do with the adjustment of a chair. Um, can you fix this? And they said, you need to wait a month. We need to get an OT to come out. So she had to wait a month with a wheelchair that did not fit right. It was uncomfortable for her to be sitting in, and she needed to use it to be able to move around. So things like that have a massive effect on how people feel. Also, treatment in society. Um, things like something as simple as going into a restaurant and asking for a table for a wheelchair causes a panic. And you, all you want is a table. You're like... Show me the table and I'll move the chair out of the way, do you know what I mean? It's a lot of diff it's very difficult in terms of things like that. Go into a coffee shop and order in a coffee and standing next to your mum and your mum having ordered the coffee and then, then speaking to you rather than her. It's as though sometimes people seem to think that because someone is in a wheelchair or suffering from an illness that they are therefore not worth talking to or not worth as much as someone else. And I think that has a massive effect on people. And also about the promotion thing, um, I obviously think that if it was to become law, not that I want that, that obviously people would have to know about it. But I think when you're talking about promotion, there's a, there's a real danger that if it's being promoted, then that's seen as the only option. And obviously, if, if that's the case, we, if, it is, if people need to know about it, we need to make sure that they are aware of every other option. And it's not just seen as one option over another. And I think that's a really, really, really big danger. Just thinking further about this, this question of does it potentially change the relationship between doctors and patients, the way in which um, doctors are perceived by patients if this bill or something similar um, comes onto the statute. I think there's a very real risk that, that it does. I mean, if, if, you, if you take a, a current discussion between a doctor and a patient, which is partly looking at issues of is the person expressing a wish to be dead or expressing a wish towards suicide, then at present that clinical discussion is primarily framed around trying to establish what are the reasons behind that wish and in particular are some of the reasons behind that wish linked to some form of mental illness. Now, if a bill of this nature is in place, then I think that does very much change that relationship to one where it is equally possible that that discussion is, is taken by the, from the point of view of the, the patient to be as much about is, is the doctor perhaps forming some sort of judgment that perhaps my life is reaching a stage where I, I wouldn't want to live it. And I, and I think there is a danger of that drifting into the kind of territory that, that both um, Sally and Catherine are talking about, which at heart is about recognising the dignity of each individual and not trying to make prejudgments about what a person thinks about their own lived existence. Anyone else? Rhoda? Just, just on this point, can I come in um, and ask about how a doctor would react, for instance, if someone came to them 
doctor was aware of that person, maybe wasn't very resilient, um, and they made a request for assisted suicide. The GP probably thinks, well, you know, given time and given support, they will, they will not want. And I suppose this is the interaction with the suicide prevention as opposed to assisted suicide. If that doctor thinks that they are actually, um, they, w they will change their <coughs> minds and don't want, will not want assisted suicide going forward, can they turn down their request or do they then have to refer them to another GP who doesn't have their background, maybe doesn't understand their way of thinking? How does it interact with um, suicide prevention? Let me have a go yes, that. please. Yeah. I, I mean, I suppose I would, I would start by expressing a, a degree of reluctance to get too much into the the detail of the bill in that, in that regard. I mean, we've got very clear policy from within the, the BMA generated by democratic processes that says we're opposed on principle to assisted dying. I, I'm, I'm not sure anyone round the table can answer from what the bill says what would actually be envisaged in a circumstance where a patient was having a discussion with a doctor, let's say it's one of their GPs, and talking about, I'm interested in assisted suicide. If the doctor was feeling, well, actually, I don't think that's, I don't think you meet the criteria or whatever, I assume that what would happen in that circumstance would be that the doctor would give the opinion to the patient that in their view they didn't meet the criteria. But I don't see that that would in any way stop the patient from simply seeking another doctor or another doctor. Professor McLean. Yeah. Sorry, I, just to come back to something I said in, in response to Peter, um, it's pretty clear I would have thought that the option of an assisted death is an option of last resort, um, metaphorically and, and literally, in the sense that it's only one of the range of options that you would expect doctors to canvas with their patients. Um, and I would not expect them to canvas it right at the very beginning, just as they don't canvas you might need chemotherapy down the line. They would say, first of all, let's try these options if they're going to work, if they're potential, if they're potentially um, suitable. And so it seems to me that the, the option of, offering, of telling a patient that this is an available option to them is merely one aspect of a very complicated process of um, to and fro between doctor and patient and recommendations from clinicians as to what they think is best. And to me, it, it in no way interferes with the suicide prevention strategy because I would expect all good doctors to start by helping someone to live and not start by offering the option to die. And I don't see why allowing it in the small number of cases where people would go that, down that whole path and still choose to die necessarily would uh, have any impact on, um, on, on the suicide prevention that most clinicians would be committed to. Um, uh, and most of the time, I suspect, it would come from the patient because the government, any government that passes this kind of bill would have the responsibility for ensuring that its availability was known about. Just teasing that one out, just in the discussion this morning, I think, the, the, and recent, uh, recent weeks, autonomy, rights, um, a human right to, you know, to, to suicide... Is a bit different from, you know, the the managing of a patient that you've just described, because ultimately there are people making the case that it's, it's right, it's right uh, how, you know, it's it's the right to do that, irrespective of this, the, the you know almost irrespective of a wide range of uh, um, uh, circumstances where they would exercise that right, uh, and ultimately it's their decision, not the doctor's decision. So how do you how do you how do you, how do you frame law that that takes account of all of that and all the pressures that may may or may not be on people? Well, I mean that that's what legislation around the world has already attempted to do, and in some cases, in many cases, seems to have done reasonably successfully. There is nothing <coughs> coercive <coughs> or anti-autonomous about advising people based on your own expertise about what it is that you could or could not do in these circumstances to alleviate your problems. That doesn't defeat autonomy. It simply helps people to make an informed decision as opposed to a random decision based on an impulse. So the, the engagement of the professional has an importance at le that level because what it does is to give people a level of expertise and knowledge about their condition and what can be done about it that they wouldn't necessarily have had had they not seen a clinician at the time. So 
the person still acts autonomously if they make the ultimate decision, but they do it on the basis of as much information as the professional can supply them with about the range of options that's open to them, including palliative care, surgery, whatever it happens to be. Um, and I would, I would like to also just make a point about rights, if you don't mind. I know I'm talking too much, but I'm sorry about that. Um, there is, as somebody said this morning, it, it makes no sense to talk about a right to die. You have an obligation to die, but you don't have a right to die. What people are arguing for is a right to choose, a right to act autonomously. And the, the, the cases in the European Court of Human Rights have been referred to already, but it's worth remembering that while they turned down Mrs Pretty's request and Mrs Purdy's request, they nonetheless did hold that Mrs Pretty's Article 8 rights, that is the right to personal integrity, had been invaded by the policy of the United Kingdom government. So they recognised it as an issue about... In personal integrity and autonomy and choice, not as an issue about a right to die. Um, I think we've got... Have we? Yep. Dr. Whit... Whit yes, Dr. Witcher, then. Um, who, Dr. Thank you. Oh, right, I'll um, I'd just like to come back on a couple of things. Um, firstly, in connection with doctors and their judgments about the quality of life that the people that they um, see have or do not have. Um, I think as a disabled, well, certainly my experience and that of other disabled people, and this is, is anecdotal, is that, uh, that whereas doctors and uh, members of the medical profession may be very well placed to say things about your medical condition, your prognosis, uh, your diagnosis, um, the fact that, that it is or isn't a, a, a life-shortening um, condition, um, that, yeah, that's one thing. But as I've said before, it is not the same thing as therefore being able to say that, that therefore your quality of life must be like this. There's, um, again, um, anecdotal evidence around um, do not resuscitate notices being put um, without consultation at the ends of people's beds without them knowing um, because assumptions are made that that person could not possibly wish to be resuscitated given the, the degree of impairment that they must experience. Um, you know, there, while these things happen, whilst there are, there, there are those attitudes within the medical profession, uh, then I think it's, it's, it's very worrying. It's more than worrying. It's, um, it's alarming to think that, that people who, who, with those sorts of judgments could be having this kind of incredibly sensitive conversation with the person that, um, that they, are, they are wishing to advise. I would also say that disabled people, <coughs> um, and we, yes, we are very directly affected by this. I think an earlier remark was that what they weren't, somebody wasn't sure that, that we were a kind of a, a key group in, um, that this is uh, targeted. Well, we certainly are, um, and you don't have to look very far uh, within the explanatory memorandum to see where um, it refers to the likes of us, the likes of me. Um, <coughs> but it's, it's you know, the, the, the question is around, you know, is it, you know, I, we need to be able to trust the, the, our medical profession, that they want to you know, what's best for our, our lives, that they're not making these false judgments, that, 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 <coughs> that they're listening to what we say, um, and that, that what, when, and where, you know, if the option, we need to be absolutely confident that, that any such suggestion is not driven by other, other considerations, like the cost of the treatment, the cost of is it palliative care, or, or, or just maintaining somebody over many years um, in, with, with a, a, who has a life-shortening condition. Um, the other point I wanted to make was about, yes, it is about autonomy, um, and it is about choice, and I know that this is what the bill is, is, is concerned to um, promote, but you have to consider what it is that causes people to make decisions. Coercion is very unlikely to take the form of somebody hitting you over the head with a, with a blunt object. That's not, not what happens. It's so much more um, indirect than that. It's about the messages you get from your culture that surrounds you. You're part of that. You absorb the messages about your life being worth less, about being scroungers, about all the rest of it. <clears throat> you, know, you absorb uh, messages about being a burden on the taxpayer. You, know, this isn't, you could say this isn't coercion, but the kind of the, the pressure that's around you, the kind of culture, alongside the fear of, of becoming disabled. I mean, there's so much, and a lot of, I think, of the support for this kind of bill is driven by a profound fear of becoming disabled, of aging, of becoming ill. And what we need to be doing here is not say, okay, well, let's make it easier for people with that profound fear 
to, to end their lives or to feel confident they could see this, this terrible thing happening. It's not terrible being disabled at all, necessarily. You have a very good quality of life, believe me. But it's not that what you need to be doing is about challenging those negative attitudes and, and making sure that the public policy is there to, so that when you are old or ill or disabled, that you get the best quality of life that you possibly can. And the support is there, and it's of the right sort, to enable you to have full and independent living as equal citizens for as long as you possibly can. Gareth. I think I need to preface my remarks by being very clear that Parkinson's UK neither supports nor opposes a change in the law, so my comments need to be taken with that in mind. I was um, interested in the conversation about the doctor-patient relationship and the difficulty of having these conversations. And it seems to me that in the experience of lots of people with conditions like Parkinson's, this spill, this um, reluctance to raise these issues already exists in relation to um, conversations about decisions to refuse treatment, um, conversations about potential loss of capacity as the condition progresses, mm -hmm. that sometimes I have heard clinicians say that they don't want to raise it because they don't want to appear to have written somebody off. And what we see in, in, in the charity is how that stops people from being able to make decisions at a time when they're able to make decisions. And I just noticed that those concerns about seeming to write people off, those concerns about potentially saying to somebody, it's not looking good, are already existing to inhibit conversations which... Which, which may be helpful to people as they as they face their life with a degenerative condition. Um, so it seems to me that the condition the, the committee needs to think about whether there's a difference between the conversation about assisted dying and other conversations about the reality of life with a condition which is deteriorating over time um, that people are already facing. Kathleen Farley. And that Sally said about coercion, I, I definitely agree. I think that the way that people are treated has a massive effect on how they feel. And again, as I said before, there are a lot of things going on in society that make people feel that like, they're not worth things. And obviously, everyone is worth something. Everything, everyone is worth the same, and everyone should be treated like that. I think that in terms of support for people who have conditions, that it's not always there. And I'm not saying that there isn't amazing support, but it's not always there, and it's not always easy to access. Also, support for the people that are looking after them isn't always easy to access. And I've discovered this myself when I've been struggling it's not always that easy to access and it's not always easy to get support and not always easy to get the right support and I think that that needs to be there no matter what we need to make sure that people are being reassured that they're going to be looked after they're going to be cared for they're going to get the best quality of care and if they need something there's going to be someone that they can phone and say look I need this and they know that they're going to try and get it for them because being in a position where you're stuck and you can't do anything about it and you need someone to help you and them not being there has such a massive effect on someone's life and especially for those around them as well and that again will have an impact on how they're being treated and by society as well they're being People with these sort of conditions aren't always being treated the way that they should, and that's ridiculous. They definitely should be treated with respect, and they should be counted among everyone else. Even so, just because someone has a condition doesn't make them any worth, worth any less than anyone else, and they need to be treated with respect, with care, and things as simple as moving things out of the way so that, you, that a wheelchair doesn't wreck a shop makes an incredible difference to how people feel. I've, um, I'll, I'll mark you down, Dennis, but I've got Richard, Richard Lyle. Um, I, I think basically the, the situation, and, and I'll go back to Professor Sheila McLean, you know, um, you know I, I'd like to know the panel, and I want your own individual views. I, we all agree we all wish to hold on to our loved ones as long as we, we possibly can. We've all had situations, unfortunately, where people have died, and, and you know, we wish we could have told them this, that, you know, or whatever, um, but shouldn't we also respect the right to, to choose to die if they want to die? You know, we had the situation earlier that a nurse was uh, sitting holding someone's hand, and and they have to face that day in day out. So, when people want to die, shouldn't uh, and I've consistently asked this question the last couple of weeks: shouldn't we allow people the right to die? 
your own individual views. No, I don't. <laughs> Catherine? Um, I think that I understand your point. However, I think that there is the possibility for safeguards and for people that have been coerced or pressured into it. There's a real danger for them. And at the end of the day, laws are here to protect you. They're here to protect people. And that's, that's how I see it. Laws are supposed to protect people. And if just one person dies from this bill who didn't want to, then that's, it's not protecting anyone. It's not protecting. And the other thing about this bill is once someone's dead, we can't bring them back. Once they have had assisted suicide, they're gone. We can't stop it. It's, it's done. You can't change it for those people. And I think that that's a massive point. Um, yeah, I was actually mainly just indicating that Catherine had been waving to you, but I, I will say something about this. The reason I was keeping a little low profile on it is Richard Lyle is asking for our personal opinions on this, and I'm absolutely not going to be giving you my personal opinion on this. I'm here to represent the, the British Medical Association. Having said that, his question is about should people not have the right to die? And I, I don't think that this is actually about this. This seems much more to me about people wishing to have as much control as possible over the way in which they die. And to some extent, the timing as well. But it's, it's mainly about, it seems to me, trying to avoid the, for some people, horrific known of what's coming, but for many people, the horrific unknown of what's coming. And that is the absolute core purpose of good quality palliative care. Um, Dr. Richard and then Professor McLean. I would echo a lot of what has just been said by both the two previous speakers. Um, you know, I'm here representing Inclusion in Scotland. I'm not here to give a, a personal view. But I suppose what I would say is that um, it, it's, not a, it, it's about the wider good. It, it's about, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why, you, why family members may wish their aged relative perhaps to be with them for longer or with them for less long. Um, again, uh, those of us outside of that family dynamic, how are we ever going to really know what's going on here? We're not. We're never going to know. And, and that's why it, it's dangerous to proceed, because you will never know the reasons why. Um, you'll never know quite what's happened or what's gone on. Um, that, that's the issue. And... and if, the, if, it's, if this lays itself open to abuse, to, to, um, and, and it's perfectly clear that it does, because by, in as much as the bill is trying to make it as easy as possible for people who want to go down this road to go down that road, they all, it's, it sim simultaneously and inevitably makes it as easy as possible for people to, to abuse it by, by the lack of safeguards. That's the problem, um, and the wider good says, if, if uh, in my view, uh, and this is my view, and I, I hope it's something that members of Inclusion Scotland would also accept, that, that if people um, uh, do not wish to um, be, uh, ultimately, if they had autonomy, choice and control over their lives, uh, they would never choose to go down that road, but they're being pushed into it by all kinds of, of the factors I've already gone through and I won't go through again, and by, and, but including by relatives who would uh, perhaps like to get their hands on the money. And, and yes, you know, people like that. Oh, like, there are people like that out there, I'm sorry to, sorry to say. Um, we cannot support something that, that uh, can allow that to happen. You know, as a, a previous speaker said, if, if you know, one person is, is assisted uh, not to die, but is, uh, some, instead it's, it's assisted murder, in effect... That, that can't be allowed to happen in a civilised society. Professor McLean. <clears throat> uh, yeah. The things, and the first thing to say is that, the, that 
so-called liberal Western democracies like, like we claim to be are based on a kind of million principle, which is that the state should not interfere to prevent people from exercising their free will unless they can show that there's harm, rather than the other way around. Um, we can speculate that, um, that there are relatives out there who would like to see their loved ones, well, I wouldn't call them that then, but then relatives or others die. Mm -hmm. But we don't actually know this to be a fact. We also don't know that the provisions of the bill could not prevent that from happening. And so I don't, I don't know that that's entirely helpful speculation. Um, but also there's, there's a problem in that there's, there's a temptation in this debate, not, not here necessarily but everywhere, to second guess the decisions of individuals. The law presumes every individual to be legally competent to make their own decisions and only if they can prove to the contrary would that decision be challenged in any other situation. So if somebody makes a decision based on a, a judgment about their, not somebody else's judgment about their quality of life, but their judgment about their quality of life, even if we don't like it, there is a sense in which we, ha we should respect it as a society unless we can show that respecting it would cause significant harm to third parties. And we don't have that evidence from any of the legislatures that have actually legalised assisted dying or voluntary euthanasia. So we need, I think, not to speculate too hard about second-guessing people's decisions. Do we need to wait on the evidence from other legislators? Here? I'm sorry? Do we need to wait on the evidence from the other legislators in terms of how it's worked out there and then we would have evidence to proceed? Well, the Netherlands would only be one country and it's not the best parallel for this bill because it also legalises voluntary euthanasia. Um, the best parallels would probably be Oregon would be the, the most obvious one, and it's also the one where they've been very, very efficient at data collection. So you have a systematic body of information about who chose it. I, I was picking up, as I understood at the point, that we have no evidence to say no. Even, if even we've, in the we've got no evidence to say no, where is the evidence to say yes? Well, that's my point, that, that, that if, you base your, if you base your society on a chameleon <coughs> approach, which we theoretically do, then the state has to prove that it has a right to intervene in people's freedoms rather than the individuals having to prove that they've got a right to make their own decisions. Dr. Richard. Well, I would not claim to be an expert in this, but it's certainly my understanding that in Oregon, it's, they spe it's specifically around terminal illness. Is that not correct? Uh, Oregon, the law is specifically around terminal illness. Is that not correct? No, they, well, you, you have to show that you're, ter you're terminally ill, um, which is one of the p potential provisions in, in this bill. In Belgium, you can also be in suffer intolerably ill. And again, the interesting thing about Belgium is that when they legislated for assisted dying, they simultaneously made it an absolute right of every citizen to have access to palliative care. Well, my point would be that this goes very, very far beyond terminal illness, the current bill. I don't therefore feel that, that the Oregon is, that is necessarily a very helpful comparison. Dennis Robertson. Thank you, convener. I think, um, to some extent, <clears throat> convener, we, we've heard that there, there's uh, obviously uh, pressures uh, on people from society um, as to whether or not someone is a burden or um, someone uh, is, is perhaps suffering. And, and it's a point that Dr. Uh, 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 Professor McLean made earlier when you were saying about a person needs to be informed. Um, but how do, we, how do we determine that the person and that information that they have in terms of being informed isn't actually coercion? Um, and it, I, I, I just wonder, do we have enough protection within the bill to determine <laughs> whether or not a person is making a decision, an informed decision, out with coercion? Um, and obviously there's a subliminal coercion, I think, that you know, has been mentioned from the sort of various societal pressures. And if we look at people with, say, disabilities, uh, and there sometimes is a fear about um, how progressive maybe their disability uh, or illness um, uh, can be. And we had that example from Belgium, which is perhaps an extreme one, but it was there where um, twins who were deaf decided that they would wish to end their life for the fear of going blind. Now, I just wonder that it, are we getting into an area where people might make decisions through the coercion, but not through information? 
Yes, P Professor McQueen, thank you. Well, it, it's a very good question because the, the problem in some ways with this bill and with all the other bills is that if the principles that underpinned it were carried through logically, you would have to allow anybody who's competent to make a choice for death. That, 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 that would be the absolutely immaculately philosophically correct uh, approach. And some of the problems start to arise when we try to limit the group to whom we think this, this, uh, this opportunity should be offered. The only thing I can say is that we don't ever know that any patient who makes a decision, whatever that decision is, is truly informed. And many of these decisions may be life-threatening um, uh, just as much as a decision about assisted suicide may be. The difference is that in the terms of this bill, people have got a long time to think about it, whereas the patient who opts for chemotherapy, for example, who is not adequately informed about the side effects, doesn't have that time to think about it. So in some ways, making the procedure cumbersome, as I would describe it, means that there's a longer period of time for people to reflect and to find out information and to ask for more information than you have in the standard situation. We don't know if doctors inform their patients properly or not. We do know that there are doctors who are reluctant to tell patients they put a DNR order on them, which seems to me to be unacceptable in the extreme. But the, 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 the trend in medicine seems to be towards in, increasingly informing patients, and we should encourage that. Um, sort of directive there, or, or direction. Uh, and the obviously there's the health and there's the social care, there's families, there's carers, there's friends, whatever. And what I'm trying to sort of get is where do we draw the line between the coercion and being informed? And is being informed directed through coercion sometimes? That's, that's where I, I have, I'm just wondering, does the bill protect the individual from the, the not having been coerced um, through being informed. What I was wanting to say is obviously, like, I think that things have a, the way you see things will have a massive effect on how it's perceived, but also. There's no way to guarantee that someone hasn't been coerced. I don't think there's a way to possibly completely 100% guarantee that they haven't been coerced. And for that reason alone, you shouldn't really be considered in the bill because you can't allow that to happen. Anyone else? Yes, please. It's certainly hard for me to conceive of a way in which a doctor could be certain that there wasn't coercion. And it seems to me that that's part of what doctors would be asked to try to arrive at a decision on within the bill and I, and I don't know how you could be certain about that and I do think that the that decision making process um, is is bound to be different in a scenario where the ultimate result is the planned death of a person that is always going to be different from having discussions with a patient about the risks or benefits of any particular treatment or having a discussion with a patient about whether or not there should be a, a do not resuscitate order. And I'd, I'd very much um, back up what, um, what Sheila was saying about it's not appropriate to be placing DNR orders without proper careful discussion with patient or if the patient doesn't have capacity anymore with the appropriate people who represent that capacity. But I think that's a, that's a very different issue from doctors effectively being asked to make a decision about whether a person has been or hasn't been coerced and on the basis of that decision then saying, in my view as a doctor, it is appropriate to proceed further down this route towards a planned assisted suicide. Does, does the issue, just picking on Professor McLean's point, does the issue of coercion, pressure, you know, just wider pressures on you that, that, that affect your decision-making process, you know, to take aggressive, intrusive treatment or indeed make a decision to withdraw from treatment which will result in your death? You know, they're, they're all the, they're, there's no difference. Is there a difference between the type of decisions you would make in embarking on intrusive, aggressive treatment or withdrawal of treatment or assisted suicide. Does, does, 
the coercion, as it's been described here, or the pressure, any different on assisted suicide as it is on any of these other areas of decisions that you would take? You know, you would, you, you would maybe be taking a decision to take that aggressive treatment, not for yourself, but be apprehensive of it, but mm -hmm. as an instinct of survival to try and keep your family together or, or you know, the last chance, you know. I, I, I'm just trying to... Is there, that principle of coercion or pressure on people to take any of these decisions any different from uh, the, the, the pressure that would be on someone to take a decision to seek assisted suicide? Is it? Uh, Professor McQueen? I can't see that it is. Um, I, it, it's, it strikes me that the critical difference between the two is that where you legalise assisted suicide, healthcare professionals feel themselves to be directly implicated in it in a way that they don't in the same way if you refuse life-sustaining treatment. And that is what often is at the root of the, the debate. Um, it's not about an ethical issue, it's, it, and it's not about coercion. The one thing that isn't in the bill, and it just occurred to me when we're talking, if there, as you probably know, in England and Wales, if um, a decision is made that doctors want to remove assisted nutrition and hydration from a patient in a permanent vegetative state. The House of Lords, as it then was, indicated that that required, it required a court to judge that that was the, the right decision. Uh, the Court of Protection in England and Wales performs that function as it does in the cases of like Tony Nicholson and so on. In the somewhat belated additional report that I sent to you, and I apologise for its lateness, one of the things that I suggested was if, they, if these were genuine concerns, bearing in mind that capacity to make a decision is a legal and not a medical concept, why don't we have a judicial or quasi-judicial body equivalent to the Court of Protection that decides on these issues? And, that, and, and the courts have plenty of experience about it on deciding about whether or not somebody has been coerced into making a decision. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would provide the kind of ultimate safeguard that people seem to be looking for. Anyone else? R Richard? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I don't, I don't know, she made me. <laughs> Dr Richard? It's okay, I don't take it personally. <laughs> but I might if you continue. Um, just quickly to come back on uh, the point around whether, if I've understood correctly, the question around whether merely being informed could be construed as coercive. Um, and where there are sufficient protections uh, it, it, within the bill to prevent that. I, I think it's impossible to, um, you know, well, the short answer is no, there aren't sufficient uh, protections. Um, something as simple as tone of voice could be construed in, in a certain way. You don't know how things are going to be received. And, of course, um, being informed about something, uh, you know, it, it becomes very close to you know, how are you supposed to interpret that? Uh, and people will interpret it differently. So and it, it's perfectly clear the safeguards are not there um, to, to prevent that from happening. But to come to the point which I, I think you were making around, you know, is, is coercion any different in, in these different sort of situations? Or, or, or does it not apply in one situation or another situation, or more so in one than another? Uh, again, I think it's terribly hard to, to, to know. And, of course... Uh, coercion of the indirect kind, you know, everything, all of us think about everything is likely to be a, a mishmash of, you know, uh, unwittingly absorbed messages from a variety of, of sources and personal experiences and all kinds of things, only some of which we're, we're probably conscious of. Um, so it's very hard to kind of pull out where, where an attitude or, or, or a or a feeling about your worth is directly to do with something that, that is legitimately what you feel and think, um, or is it whether it's something that has been foisted upon you in an indirect means. But I suppose the difference between this kind of legislation and other forms of ways in which people might choose to end their lives, um, firstly, it's about it giving out a very clear message that this is... Not, is not just politically legitimised and legally legitimised, but socially legitimised. Um, there's evidence, uh, not necessarily from Oregon, but from Belgium and the Netherlands, about the increase in, in uptake of these, of, um, of once these, these measures to come in into being. Um, you know, worries about the expansion. I mean, the most recent uh, expansion, I believe, was in Belgium, where a convicted... Um, I think it was a rapist and murderer 
uh, wished to be put out of their misery and was given uh, was was duly put out of their misery. I think that, that happened at the beginning of this year. So you're starting to see you know, it's not even just children. We're starting to see see it kind of move into all kinds of different categories. And I think it, it it's. <laughs> The, the problem is that you, you, and I think in the previous session, talked about the change in almost like kind of culture in, within the medical profession and socially, where it becomes almost, well, that's what you do. And if you, you know, it becomes, if you feel like your life is worthless, well, that's your right to kind of, you know, put an end to it. But conversely, we have all this, this, this sort of you know, emphasis on suicide prevention. And, and why is it? I mean, how are we going to disentangle that one? I mean, I certainly can't do it here and now, but I think that there's some you know important points there. Um, other angles around the link between suicide and deprivation. And I think one of the more spurious arguments around this is uh, this bill is about it opening up the opportunity for people uh, to end their lives, uh, those who can't afford to go to, to Switzerland. Um, I think that's you know particularly. Um, and, and you know, links between deprivation and suicide as anyway being being clearly um, defined. So there are some, some very very big questions here um, around how you, you know, the, the, the implications, where this could lead, what it is. And I think again, a previous speaker said it's not about a slippery slope. It's quite purposeful. There's a campaign in in Holland, I believe, which is seeking to make this available to anybody over the age of seventy. Um, you know, anyone who just thinks their life's a bit, you know, they're just a bit fed up with it. I mean, who knows? As you say, people could make decisions for all kinds of reasons. And it's not about saying people shouldn't have autonomy, but it's about understanding what it is that makes people choose things, where, where the things that are inevitable, and where things like public policy, different kind of cultural messages, can make a huge difference to the choices that people would make, to the direction to which they would use their autonomy. I keep coming back to that, and I've yet to hear anybody um, uh, come up with a, a, an answer or, or an argument that, that goes against that. Richard Simpson. You know, um, Professor McLean has raised the issue that I wanted to, the, our witnesses to address today, and it came up with Baroness Finlay as well, who was who is an opponent of this bill, and uh, Professor McLean, I hope I'm not misconstruing her, is generally in favour of it, or in favour of something. And that is the concerns, we've heard all the concerns about the doctors, and we've heard today from Catherine Farley and, and Sally Witcher about the concerns of coercion and about attitude of society, etc. It seems to me that actually having it done in the way that was proposed in this bill doesn't answer these questions adequately, but a court system might, or a tribunal system might. In other words, one that takes it out of the hands of the individual doctor and their relationship and puts it into the hand of, of a court that if someone wishes to apply to be part of an assisted suicide, that is the individual themselves and the person who is going to facilitate that, jointly apply to a court for the, for the right to do it, then it seems to me that there is at least the potential for a proper examination of all the factors. For example... Are they receiving the care that they should be receiving at the present time? Because if the court says they're not, and that the reason that they want to commit suicide is simply because their dignity is not being adequately respected or they're not getting the aids and equipment that allows them to have a life that, they, that would be reasonable, then the court can actually say, you know, we, we think that the, the palliative care issue has not been fully explored or adequately explored or, you know, the other issues have not been properly explored. So... Can I just, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm being a bit long-winded, but in the question of whether this really should not reside in either a court or a tribunal rather than the, the mechanisms that are proposed within this bill at the present time. Sorry, there's just yes, one thing, Catherine. and that is the capacity issue is important as well, and we haven't talked about that. Catherine. Um, my issue with what you said there is that no safeguard is 100%, and again, it's someone's life that we're talking about. Um, so we can't 100% guarantee that they haven't been coerced or something hasn't happened to force them to make this decision. And things can be wrong, so we can't guarantee, and it's someone's life, so we can't allow it. Anyone else? Bob? 
Just, just very briefly, I, I, I apologise, I don't want to take too much time in the committee, but I was interested in, in Dennis Robertson's line of question <coughs> in relation to coercion. It just made me think again about the nuts and bolts of the bill um, and whether a, if someone goes to a GP saying, look, I've got this declaration, whether what's taken it, face value is the wrong expression, but if what a suspicion of coercion, what, what that would involve and what kind of toolkit could GPs or others have to, 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 to do the best they can to make sure there's not a form of coercion if that was um, if that was deemed to be the situation. But also, like moving away from that, let's assume we could solve that or it needs to be solved. Um, an individual could then, therefore, in theory, go to another GP who could who could sign off on, on, on whatever, um, at which point any alleged um, concerns of coercion, um, because you know family GPs might, might, might know other members of that family quite well, may have them on, their, on, 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 their, on their, their patient list, and be aware of dynamics that say another GP that doesn't know the family wouldn't. I'm just wondering if there should be something within whatever system, if this was to be passed, where a GP had concerns of coercion, how they could therefore notify um, whoever that person would be of that, because in theory, an individual could go to another GP and go through the process of assisted suicide, and the initial GP that had concerns may, may be unaware of it. I'm just, uh, just uh, I'm trying to think about how we can build in as many safeguards as possible if we do go through this process of, of, of seeing this bill make its way through Parliament. Does there have to be whether it's regulations or something on the face of the bill to see what that should look like. Or tribunals or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I've got, a, got a Dr. Witchard, um, Dr. Bainey, and, what, what, um, and I've got Nanette and whatever, and I've, you know, I want to get Patrick in before we finish, you know, so if you're comfortable, I send out for lunch or, <laughs> what, you know, so. But, um, you know, um, <clears throat> First of all, um, uh, Dr. Witchard um, and uh, brief contributions at this stage, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I just quickly wanted to come back about the idea of the courts, and you know, I can understand why that may, might be put forward as a, as a suggestion. I think, though, we need to be really clear that the courts are n not necessarily any better place than anybody else to make judgments about people's quality of life, and you need look no further than the case of um, Ms. Elaine MacDonald, uh, who, um, in 2009, who, uh, she was a former Brahma ballerina, suffered a, a life-altering stroke. Um, her local authority um, thought it was perfectly fine to leave her in incontinence pads for 10 hours at a stretch. Uh, this case was taken to um, the European uh, courts, who ruled that uh, it wasn't a breach of her human rights, it was, uh, it was OK to do this. They had discretion um, because it would be of benefit to the wider community um, because of the savings they'd achieve. That uh, I think um, would be one of you know, one example of where courts somehow have singularly failed to understand uh, what quality of life actually means and why it's so why dignity is so important. Uh, Dr. Bain, only one brief thing to say about courts. One would assume that the level of proof required in any such process would be the civil standard of balance of probability rather than the, the criminal standard, and that would certainly be rather short of the, the standard that Catherine's looking for. In terms of the issue that Bob Doris raised about um, if the first doctor has concerns and therefore doesn't agree to the request or doesn't fill in the paperwork, what safeguards can you put in place to prevent shopping around, if you'll pardon the phrase? Difficult for me to see how you could safeguard against that, particularly in a process which is predicated on the autonomy of the patient. Anyone else want to respond to that? Am I, am I right to understand that, you know, the, the general principle with, with the, the court case you mentioned, and uh, would they not send that back to parliamentarians, really? And are, they, are the courts keen to be dealing with these? Or are they not saying to, you know, parliaments and, uh, you know, <coughs> you need to sort out the detail and this is, can't be left up to the court. So they're not actually saying that themselves. The In the PBS cases? Yeah. No. 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 The court was specially created to deal with those difficult issues. Because uh, unlike in Scotland, when the Tony Bland judgment was reached, the court said that in all situations where treatment withdrawal was 
was predicted. Because this is, bear in mind, this is not somebody who's made their own decision. People are making a decision on their behalf um, that this should always be scrutinised by a court. We didn't do that in the equivalent Scottish How case. Assisted suicide, then? Well, the, the, the quasi judicial or judicial body is, is it's simply a mechanism uh, not to judge quality of life because the individual's done that themselves, but to decide whether or not the person is making an informed, free, uncoerced decision. Mm -hmm. That's something that courts do all the time. Um, and they've made many decisions in respect of medical care on the question of coercion. Uh, very often in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, but not always in those cases. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's merely a thought that, if, that if, if people are sufficiently concerned that individuals can't make up their own minds, and I think they can, but if, they didn't, if people don't believe that, then that is one route to providing the kind of reassurance that somebody will have scrutinised the quality of the decision over and above the GP if we think it's necessary to second-guess people's original choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would the courts not then probably try to gain um, some obviously professional opinion? So therefore the courts may go back to say getting a psychiatric um, assessment done and maybe other reports um, to try and uh, enable them to come to a decision. So it would be prolonged, protracted um, and I'm just wondering you know, whether or not the, the mechanism they would use um, is, is something that we could maybe build into the bill in the first instance that every person requires uh, maybe a psychiatric assessment. It's not by any means my preferred option. I, I merely make the point that it is one potential mechanism to ensure that some of the concerns that have been raised can be met head on. Um, I, you know, it, it, it does at least ensure that the test of capacity, which is a legal test, as I keep saying, not a medical test, is adequately addressed. And that, so we are sure that somebody is competent and we are sure that somebody is freely making a decision, in as much as anyone makes a free decision. Um, uh, and that, that's one way of testing the validity of the actual ultimate choice that is made. But it's not the only way. I, I don't think it's necessary, but it is a possibility. Tana. I want to come back again on the point of capacity, which was a major issue in our um, in our submission, um, just about the need for, if the law were to be changed, whatever system there was, would have to have a, a more robust system to assess capacity, particularly in people with progressive neurological conditions like Parkinson's, where there's issues of fluctuation, but also issues of measurement of capacity, which are um, not necessarily typical. And the, the bill, as it's currently drafted, wouldn't um, meet those criteria, I don't think. Nanette, and then I'm going to go with Pat Patrick with the permission of the committee. OK, thank you. Just Nanette. briefly to touch on something. It hasn't been dealt with today at all, and that's the, the role of the licensed facilitator, um, and particularly the sort of interaction between the facilitator and the, the health professionals, because presumably this, this person is someone who's not well known to the, or has no interest, interest in, in, the, in the, the, the patient's, uh, or the person's future. Um, and also the, the very fine line which there is between actually assisting suicide and committing euthanasia, um, which a facilitator could be faced with in someone who's extremely disabled and perhaps unable to take whatever portion that they would plan to take committing suicide. Any comments around the table on that one? Any takers on that one? Yes. <laughs> For what it's worth, I, I mean, you'll have seen from my first submission that I actually cannot work out what the facilitator is for beyond what the name implies. Uh, it seems to me that if someone is is to help someone in the situations of, of, of this gravity, that it would be far better that they were somebody that the person knew and knew well and who cared about them than it is to have a stranger. I understand why the stranger bit was built in, but it seems to me to not make any particular sense. So my answer to your question in a sense is I don't think we should have them in the first place. Oh, OK. Uh, I'm just looking here. Patrick. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, if I could pick up, first of all, just one uh, simply factual matter with uh, Dr Benny. Um, you explained the, the BMA's position, and at one point I think you said... Um, 
that that's a policy generated by the democratic process within the, the BMA. My understanding is that the BMA hasn't yet uh, asked its full membership for, for a position on this, and in fact has um, voted on a few occasions not to do so. Could you, could you tell me, am I, am I wrong in that? Has the full membership been asked uh, for a, a range of opinions? And if so, what is the balance of opinion within the BMA's membership? Okay. Either on this bill or on the general yeah. principle? I'll, it's on the general principle. The, this specific bill has not been put to any uh, BMA democratic process. Um, how the BMA determines its policy is at our annual representative meeting, which is roughly analogous to the, the National Political Party's annual conferences. And at that meeting, on several occasions over the past 10 years, there have been debates on various issues around assisted death, euthanasia. We've got all of the policy and can share all of that with you at a later stage if necessary. It's probably helpful to um, almost declare, I suppose, as, as a... a an interest rather than a conflict of interest that one of my previous roles within the association was to be the, the chairman of that annual representative meeting and so I've actually chaired six of the annual ethics debates on various ethical matters and several of them were dealing with issues of assisted death and assisted suicide. Now throughout that process on one occasion I think in 2006 the policy that was arrived at after considered debate was to take a position of neutrality, not to take a decision either way. But that policy was reversed again by the, the democratic process the next year. And for all the rest of the time, we have had very clear policy that I, I outlined before. Now, of course, and we, this was touched on in the first session as well, of course that doesn't mean that every single of the 150,000 plus members of the British Medical Association is opposed to assisted death but we are quite confident that the majority are. You asked, have we put this question to the entire membership in an opinion poll or a questionnaire? No, we haven't. And we touched on an issue with one of our sister organisations before when they did so, getting a very small percentage response from their overall membership. In our view, on something as important and as nuanced as this, you get a better chance of a considered proper decision if you have a democratic debate and then a vote at the end of that than you do if you send out a questionnaire with the likelihood with any questionnaire that you'll struggle to get a 10% response. And so we effectively formulate our policy, it seems to me, in much the same way that most national political parties do and in a way that is steeped in democracy. The, the comparison with political parties is interesting in a case like this, which political parties themselves uh, tend to be neutral on and allow this to be a, a matter of conscience for individual elected members. I'm wondering if you haven't taken the proactive approach of surveying your full membership on, on the basis that you expect a low turnout, is there any other way in which the delegates who are presumably elected locally to go to the, the annual uh, representative meeting, is there any other way in which they solicit the views and try to find out what the balance of opinion is there yes, must be some way of, of determining what the balance of opinion is. Well, there's two points about that. The first is about how the representative meeting works, and the second is about the um, other process that we've, we've just put in place. I'll get to that in a minute. In terms of the representativeness of those who attend the meeting, they are specifically intended to represent the constituencies that they've come from, and so they are asking for opinion from the broader sway of doctors out there. What we're also doing as an association over the course of this year, over the course of the next few months, is running a series of meetings across the UK, including two in Scotland, where we will be consulting specific groups of doctors and of the general public, um, selected at, at random the doctors, but taking into account the various different um, branches of practice and, and specialties to try to get a representative sample. And what we're doing there is, in effect, trying to get a bit more in the way of depth of knowledge about what is the overall view, yes, but also what's the, th what's the reasoning, what's the thinking behind the overall view. And that's a process that's going to take place over the course of this year. It's not designed to either... Um, 
reinforce policy or to change policy, but it's a different way, uh, in effect, sort of qualitative research, if you like, of looking at what are the opinions of our members and at the same time in parallel, trying to look in a bit more detail at what are the opinions of the general public. Because again, in the earlier session this morning, we heard a bit about the, the headline figure of roughly 80% of the, the general public being in favour of some form of assisted suicide or assisted dying. But often when you dig down into the detail of that, those percentages can change. So we'll be in a position by the end of the year, I think, to have an even more solid base than we do at present. But I'm quite confident we've got a solid democratic base for the, the view that we take. So in, in short, you're confident there's a majority, but you're not able to say what the proportion is? Um, I'm confident there's a majority. I also know it's absolutely obvious that there are a number of doctors in the minority of our membership who are against. Okay. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on, on a, another argument, and this, um, I think, began to be articulated, first of all, by Dr. Witcher, but several other members of... Um, mentioned it. And sorry, as Rhoda Grant did, I should also just declare an interest that um, my office participates in the internship programme from Inclusion Scotland, and we have somebody based in the office at the moment. Um, some of the arguments around um, quality of life, which of course is subjective and in, in this bill is would, would be judged by the individual themselves, not, not judged uh, by somebody else about them, but also about ongoing external pressures. Um, issues around uh, inclusive support, issues around uh, poverty in the welfare system. Uh, I think Dr. Witcher used the phrase uh, dignity, choice and control in the way that you live. I'm just wondering whether the witnesses generally perceive this as a, a categorical distinction between people for whom that's an ongoing pressure uh, or set of ongoing pressures in their lives and those for whom even with the best public attitudes the best quality of services, it's reached beyond the point where someone is, is able to exercise dignity, control and choice in the way that they live because they are dying. Acknowledging that this bill includes quite a broad spectrum of scenarios, is there a categorical distinction that witnesses would see between the issues that are raised in relation to people who are living and people who are actually dying and wishing to take control of the, the means or the timing of that, that death? Any of the panel witnesses wish to respond to that? Dr. Witcher? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, is there a, a categorical difference? Um, no, not really, because I think I would reject the idea that a dignity becomes an impossibility um, at any point. Um, with, with palliative care, with the right support, so on and so forth. And, and I think dignity is absolutely critical here. Um, it, it's a, a, yes, it's a continuum. Um, and yes, there are degrees um, that will be possible, no doubt, in terms of what people can effectively do. Um, but um, I think the, the, the point is, though, that, that uh, and I think the more important point around, around this and the distinction is that if you don't have dignity, choice, and control when it comes to how you live your life, then the, um, the attraction of, of having dignity, choice, and control in terms of how you, you um, go about your death is, is uh, increased. Um, because otherwise, you, know, you're, you are, and, and as I said, with Oregon, it's very clear that those sorts of reasons are the reasons. It is about dignity, choice, control, that's what causes people to go for, for, for it rather than um, things like pain and, uh, and suffering primarily. So I, I, I think that's what I would say. I, you know, if it, you know, if, if, are, we, are we as a society prepared to just say, okay, there's going to be an, ex, you know, when, once you get to a certain stage, and that's very when that stage could shift with public policy, um, where beyond which uh, actually, you know, you're not going to get choice and control. Um, uh, and dignity isn't going to be possible. I mean, I, I'm reluctant. Um, in fact, I'm not prepared to accept that, because I think a society that accepts that uh, is going is going down in, is risk going down a very dangerous path. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I can say on it. Um, <coughs> I think that's a very 
sort of difficult question for an organisation to answer. What I would say is that you would find within the 10,000 people in Scotland who are living with Parkinson's disease a, a real range of views on, 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 on whether that is from um, a position like Dr. Witcher's to, um, um, to one that Margaret MacDonald would have held around, around where, those, where those positions lie. And I, I think it's really difficult to make an absolute when the people that I work with have such a very wide range of views on, on this issue. Um, it's very hard to come down on one side or the other without seeming to disrespect the views of people on both sides of the debate. Anyone else? Patrick? Um, I, I think those are the two main issues that I wanted to pick up on uh, from the, 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 the evidence that we've heard. I, I mean, I, I would maybe just reflect, I, I find it hard to, to understand how someone could not accept that some people are reaching the point of death. Uh, and albeit there, there are a range of scenarios catered for in this bill, it does seem to me that there are uh, significant distinctions in, in the issues or the objections that might be raised in those different scenarios. Uh, with your permission, Kavina, I'd like to write to the committee to pick up on several of the points that have uh, been made uh, over the course of the evidence sessions, uh, and uh, I think that might be the most effective way of responding to the, the very many points that have been raised, otherwise we might be here for a very long time. Yes. And you'll have that opportunity at some stage anyway in, in, yes, indeed. in coming weeks. And I thank you all for your attendance this morning, um, the evidence you've given, and the, 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 of course the written evidence that we've received from you. From you. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to suspend at this time, and I'm going to call on the. Go to private session as well. Uh, we're going into private session. Um, you know, I know you're all under pressure, but if we clear the room, we can be out here in ten minutes. Mm -hmm.